This next episode is all about a woman's tale of what it was like going through the Mao revolution in China, which basically led to a one party controlled China, the Chinese Communist Party. She escaped it. She moved here to the US of A and now she comes on to not only tell her story, but also talk about the similarities of what was going on in China back then and what's going on in the US right now. This isn't for everybody. Some, a lot of people won't be able to stomach it. Some of you will be able to, and I appreciate you being here. Everybody, no matter what, thank you for all the support. I love you all. Seriously, thank you for being here. If you don't mind, head over to iTunes, leave us a review, and sign up for our free email newsletter. Links in the description. All right, love you guys. Enjoy the episode. Cheers. Winning season has officially returned, and with the NFL preseason live, there are plenty of opportunities for all of us to win big over at MyBookie. Whether you're a seasoned better or this is your first time, you're just getting your feet wet, MyBookie is going to give you the most for your money, and here's how. They're going to double your deposit up to $1,000. To claim your bonus, sign up, use the promo code SRS and my bookie will instantly double your money. It's simple. A $200 deposit puts $500 in your account that you can use to bet on individual games, contests, or use the prop builder as you see fit. Bet on team win totals, bet on who you think is gonna win the Super Bowl, or use the prop builder to give you the edge that you need to win all the money. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere at mybookie.com. Use the promo code SRS. Lily Tang Williams, welcome to the Sean Ryan Show. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is great. It's been a pleasure talking to you before we get here. And we've had a ton of people request you to come on the show. Wow. And so here we are. Well, I'm honored. I did not know lots of people request you to interview me. I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that. Good. They absolutely did. Um, so I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. Lily Tang Williams grew up in a very poor family in China during the Mao Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, which we'll dive into a little later became a law professor at age 21. You left China for University of Texas in 1988. You were able to fool the CCP into coming here. And now you're running for Congress in New Hampshire because you want to save America. Am I missing anything? That's a pretty accurate Perfect. and a very good summary. <laughs> All right. Well, we always start every show with a gift. So here's your wow. gift. Any guesses? It's kind of heavy. The Xiang Ryan Show. Can I open it? Absolutely. That's what it's for. Oh. You know what? My first time open gifts that's wrapped up was uh, my 21st birthday, 24th birthday on the campus of UT Austin. Nice. I know. My graduate school faculties and 
and professors hold a birthday party for me, I was totally shocked and surprised. I had no idea. My birthday in China is a boiled egg. <laughs> oh my goodness, look. Oh. Those are Vigilance Lead gummy bears. Oh, I love gummy Made in the bears. USA, not in China. Oh, I love gummy bears too. Good. Thank you so much. Yes, you got your own brand. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I, yeah. You probably have lots of products named after your brand. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, the three package of them. That will last me for a long time. Oh, good. <laughs> Especially on the camping trail, right? <laughs> Thank you You can so just set much. it down back there. Okay. Perfect. So before we dive in, we want to talk a lot about your upbringing in China, and then we'll get into some current events type stuff. But lately in the news, Nancy Pelosi just visited Taiwan, and um, China warned us that there would be repercussions if that happened, which they did just launch missiles right outside of Taiwan. What do you think about that? What are your thoughts on Well, my visit? campaign actually issued a press release. I came out immediately um, to support policy. And I, I tell people as the only congressional candidate, Republican candidate running for Congress this year, I stand with Pelosi. I support her to show solidarity and uh, stand with Taiwan the thing is, though, I think America will look very weak if she did a back down because their threats from CCP, a thuggish government not elected by the people. Republic of China, which is Taiwan, has vibrant democracies and a lot more freedom than mainland Chinese. So let the CCP to control our elected officials traveling itineraries Gingrich went to Taiwan in the 90s. Why can't Pelosi decide she wants to go with a delegation? I even tweeted, if I was in the Congress, I would join her. I could be even, you know, because I'm truly bilingual, right? I mean, Mandarin was my native, you know, mother tongue language. We have to absolutely support Taiwan. That's a truly a uh, example for 1.4 billion Chinese on mainland to say Chinese people are capable of freedom and democracy and the free market capitalism. So people need to understand Chinese government in Beijing is a one party dictatorship, not elected by people. That's why they don't care about the people. Remember the COVID? Mm -hmm. First response, any crisis, the local government officials, CCP officials want to cover them up because they might lose their job. If the boss, top boss in Beijing found out, oh, you mishandled this. So they want to cover up because they don't care about people's sufferings because the only way they lose their job is to get fired by their top boss in CCP, but not by the people. So people, actually, the Chinese people are the biggest victims of a CCP government, where Taiwan people, according to the poll, and they saw what happened in Hong Kong, they don't want to go back to China because unification means they're gonna lose their democracy and freedom. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Especially younger people in Taiwan. Who? They learned from Ta Hong Kong, like, hey, one country, two systems don't even work. What do you think their interest is in Taiwan? Why is it so, why are they so fixated on Taiwan, despite, Be possible repercussions if they interfere? They are afraid of uh, Taiwan because, as I said, Taiwan is a free country with democracy, and uh, communists hate freedom and democracy. And you know what they worry about most? Is Taiwan is an example for mainland Chinese. So if they can collapse Hong Kong, control Taiwan, that means the mainland Chinese, you know, will not know what the true freedom democracy is about. That's what communists do. They want to take over probably lots of places, including other free world countries, because they hate their own people. Someday wake up to say, you know what? 
How come we live like slaves? We cannot vote. We cannot have freedom. And why in lockdowns, government tell us lockdown every 24 hours, go charge your COVID app to see if I can have another 24 hours freedom. That's what they're doing now. Yeah. You look at Shanghai, you look at Shenzhen under lockdown. Those are the most international, wealthy cities in China. They look like dead. It's so sad to say that I don't I think the China economy is about to collapse because of that. Because of that. And they are trying to distract to say, you know, because they control all the propaganda to say, oh, demonize America, demonize Pelosi to visit Taiwan. She she did not say anything unusual. She just said we stand with Taiwan. We we support democracy and freedom. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But the Chinese Communist Party now is doing all the trainings and all this stuff. And I'm I'm glad she actually kind of called their bluff out. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. I never thought I would stand with Pelosi, but I do think that she did well, the right Well, that's move. what I'm saying. We don't have to be partisan on everything. When our elected politicians do right thing, we should give them the credit. And I... I, I don't know how many people were Republicans on her delegation. I suggest to her she should take both party elected officials to go with her. Yeah. But lots of Republicans already did before she showed up. But because she's like the number three, the most important person in the U.S. politics, that's why China is making all the noise and threats. Yeah. Well, let's get ready to dive into the interview. One last thing. I always take a... a question from my patrons over on patreon they're why i'm sitting here they're why you're sitting here they're our biggest supporters and this one is from paul garrison and i had to pick paul because paul has been suggesting you to come on this show for probably six months now well wow, thanks paul <laughs> yeah so paul's question is can the u.s avoid its own version of the culture revolution through legislation through legislature, or will it take more homegrown? Will it take a more homegrown approach through strong families and local communities banding together? Well, I think the cultural revolution I see in America has been going on for probably thirty something years, maybe forty years. So it's not like uh, some uh, magic wand that uh, we can just legislate from federal level and to change our culture. And uh, I think that's a part of the communist like people plan. Remember Yuri and Mesmerov who come out to say the communists have a plan for America. Mr. Besmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet army officer. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? Ideological subversion is, is the slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, activne meropriatia in the language of, of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. Through four stages. That guy is a former KGB. He knows. He knows. He was defector. The number one stage, he said, uh, demoralize America. That kind of is like a remind me of uh, mouse destroy the four O during the Cultural Revolution. Demoralize, like a destroy four O is a destroy old culture, ideas, custom, and habits. But uh, why did the Mao even mention that? What his agenda, purpose to do cultural revolution in to destroy age-old Chinese culture? Because he used cultural revolution to purge his political 
enemies within Communist Party. Hmm. And lots of people might not know that. Um, Mao was marginalized, lost his uh, top leader status, lost the president, president position to Mr. Liu Shaoqi. Liu Shaoqi wanted to reboot economy because Mao started the Great Leap Forward. And those a few years, 40 million people estimated to starve to death. 40 million? Yes, 40 million peasants, mostly in the countryside, poor rural villages who support his communism, supported Communist Party, died of starvation. So that's something lots of people in this country don't know. I even did not know until I came to this country. My English got better. And I, I was told from 1958 to 1961, there were three years natural disasters. Drought, flooding, bugs, blame everything else. Then the people were starving. Because my dad told me he was living on one Chinese steam bomb a day. Oh, man. As a worker, full-time worker for state factories. And uh, luckily, I, I was born in 1964, but I heard of three years natural disasters all my life in China. Unfortunately, lots of people still believe that. They still don't know the truth today. I learned the truth after I come to this country. And uh, I cried after I found out how many people die of starvation. And the people don't know the truth. And I was totally indoctrinated myself, so I did not know anything about that. I was just told to say, oh, you're lucky you have, you have some food to eat now, and you're not starving. Because my dad was a young man, very muscular, and um, he grew up as often. He just wanted to feed his stomach when he got recruited to go to work for a state factory in, in, in city instead of you know, work on the farm you mm -hmm. know, in a village where... You know, he become an orphan. He never had one day of schooling. He could not read. My dad is a totally illiterate. Oh, wow. I know. that. Uh, that's why they always tell me, we are starving because we don't have education. Your mom, dad could not move up inside of the Communist Party ranks. And you need to get the best education possible so you can have a better job. They were factory workers. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so to answer Paul's question, though, that uh, I feel like a demoralization of America is already accomplished. Look at the today's America. Our young people demonize America, call America systemic racist country. You got a CRT, social emotional learning, 1619 project, identity politics, and transgender ideology in our schools, it's all about demoralize American and American families and turn kids against the nuclear families. So they belong to the state. I mean, how you cannot just legislate, oh, I'm going to change people's mind or hearts. That requires time and work. That's why they defend parental rights is my top second campaign issue. Because when you take away parental rights, like all the communist countries do, your kids become the property of the states. And they can push all kinds of curriculum, information, privacy, tracking, data collection, indoctrination to schools. And parents have not, no say in that. Look, they shut down schools. Did you have some say about shutting down schools during the past COVID? And uh, they're teaching all this crazy stuff. And teachers union, NEA, said, we're going to teach critical race theory in 14,000 school districts. So you think the Cultural Revolution is already over? You it's happening now. It's happening. But the demoralization to America, in America, according to, you know... Um, the demoralization. Uri, yeah, it, it's done. It has been going on for the past 40 years. Mm -hmm. And now... Um, once you demoralize, and, uh, and, and now we are, I think we are in the, probably um, in the third, third stage, which is uh, 
constant crisis after crisis after crisis, right? It demoralize, then it destroy, and then you uh, you you create a crisis, crisis, and then you trying to last the stage is trying to normalize it. When you try to normalize, after you already destroy the traditional and values and culture we have, so you normalize with what? With their control, with their power. So that would be like what? Replace America with socialism, globalism. Yeah. Instead of individual liberty, and uh, and and uh, individual citizens' rights should not be infringed and guaranteed. Actually, give to us by our Creator, by God. You know, our rights pre-exist government, pre-exist even constitution. So, but the same so, our young generations, for two generations now, they have been indoctrinated to believe otherwise, to believe in government. That's another thing. It's by destroying their families, by destroying their um, you know, the, the religions and demonize religions, demonize capitalism and capitalists and prophets. Guess what they do? They want you to believe on government. And, uh, you know, the worst religion in the whole world, in my eyes, is a statism, is a believing government. Because they are the only ones who actually have a monopoly in force. They have guns. They have a presence, and they can lock you up and take you away. You can hate a corporation all you want, but you don't have to buy their products, right? Yeah. And you have some kind of competition, and hopefully, even with social media, big tech companies, but when government has monopoly in force and controls everything, that's what you get, like communist China. Well, let's move towards your upbringing in China during the Mao culture revolution, what was it like growing up with that? Well, I was two years old and uh, my memory started in this uh, row house, like uh, eight families, and live in this uh, workers' row house provided by my dad's state factory. And uh, all one story, and uh, mom, dad with children, and my memory started from there. One bathroom. <laughs> One bathroom, which is a, just a big hole on the ground. So they dig a big hole on the ground, and uh, then they put a divider in the middle. So one, one hole is for woman, one hole is for man. You can talk to each other. You can talk to your neighbors. You can hear each other doing number one, number two, have a conversations. And uh, it's just two breaks over the hole. So when you go to number two, number one as a little girl, you have to find the two breaks. So when the night bulb goes out, I was afraid to go to the bathroom. We were too poor to afford a flashlight. And so, so everybody just had to buy a little party for the apartment. So you... If you don't want to go to the bathroom at night, you just do in your apartment. Next day, you can go dump it. Uh, because uh, everything belongs to the state. No private property ownership. So because it's a community housing, who cares to put a new light bulb on when light bulb go busted, right? So I was so afraid to go to the bathroom at night. And uh, because if you're not careful, you can fall backwards. And you'll be buried by human waste. And I think every couple of weeks, a peasant will come to dig out of the human waste and take to the agriculture field to use as fertilizer. That's why Chinese were trained never, never eat salad. We did not have salad because it's not safe to eat raw food. It have to be all boiled, high temperature to kill all the, you know, germs and uh, in what Chinese water, boil everything. Bottled waters were kind of luxurious item. When I first came to this country, it was my kind of old habits, like looking for boiled water. <laughs> I was afraid to drink tap water. <laughs> so, so I just remember that, and the bugs were flying around, and the flies and worms were crawling on the, you know, that bath, you know, like a restroom floor. I was traumatized as a child. 
Because if you're not careful, when you go to that female hole, you could step on those bugs crawling on the floor. When you step on it, they make a horrible, disgusting, this pop noise. Um, by talking about it, I feel like I get goosebumps. I think I was traumatized by that. I just really absolutely hated that. And I hated everything crawling on the floor. You know, the biggest animal scares me. It, it's a snakes crawling. It's, you, you, you just, I think it's associated with that. And then in the summer, they all become flies and you're flying around and zzz, constantly to make noise. We did not have any kind of cooling or heating. So winter was extremely cold. I, I had the frostbite on my left foot. Every year I got the same spot, have frostbite as a little girl. And... Uh, so they get really, really itchy because uh, um, when you, I think when you get a warm, but you got a frostbite, and then you get a warm, and then you want to scratch it, and they get itchy. And I always broke my skin and get infected. So after years now, just the scars are always there. And uh, I don't know how much memory I don't remember because my dad and my younger brother recently told me, you know what, you're the one who threw away dad's some bare fat. Because I was asking last year, who threw away those bare fat? Dad got really mad and spanked me, think I did it, but I didn't do it. My brother, which is five years younger than me, my baby brother, he said, you did it. You don't remember? I said, no. I saw somebody else did it. Dad was really mad. I, I don't know what happened. I... So I think there are some memories I swept under the rug when you are traumatized. And I don't know when they're going to come out. So another memory, I did not want to talk about it. I avoided think about it. And I discovered last year the truth is that my grandmother was babysitting me at the peak of Cultural Revolution, 68, you know, 69, I was four or five years old. And then my grandma's family and the whole neighborhood right now in this community water well as a source of water, 20 feet deep. And uh, so, you, so you go down there, you use a little rope to get your bucket down there, get the water, and then, then you know, get the bucket up. That's how you get your fresh water and you go boil it for your cooking and washing clothes. And uh, one morning, everybody was looking at water well to say, come look, come look. I, I ran there to took a look. I think I must immediately run away because I don't remember, I never asked question. I saw a dead man lick it on top of that water well. Like, oh, so scary. And, and uh, why, I never asked why. I just run away and don't talk about it. I think I swept under the rock for many years. When I got sick last year in the hospital, I don't know why. I got COVID. I was sick, lying there, no visitor, doing nothing, very weak, just think about my childhood and close my eyes and, and with uh, what's going on in today's America. I, just, I don't know why when you get so sick, so ill, or you think about your past. And I, I said, what happened? to that man, who was that man? How come I never asked that question? So when I came home last year from the hospital, I talked to my uncle in China, uh, uh, WeChat, to say, I recovered, uncle. I will think about past. Who was that man? My favorite uncle, one of three uncles who was part of Red Guards. He said, black family, black class member committed suicide. He could not handle the struggle sessions anymore. People start to Google struggle sessions under Mao's Cultural Revolution. So basically, Mao used a standard Marxist communist theory. People are divided into two giant groups, which we use them today. Oppressor versus oppressed. Who are the oppressors under Mao? five black classes, rich farmers, 
landlord, race, um, like a county revolutionaries, rightist, bad influencers. So you got three categories, very subjective. How do you define they were black classes or the party? They call them black classes? Yes, five black. Five black versus five red. And, uh, but uh, under five black classes, they're all oppressors. So they're supposed to go to this public square to lower their head, to apologize for being black, to be public and shamed, and the red guards throw rocks at them. Mao also shut down schools. So the urban youth had no school to go to, so they can do cultural revolution full time. Go eliminate your political enemies. I was a red child. Okay, here are these five red classes. Under oppressed. Workers, peasants, like I'm a worker's child. Because actually I could be black if my grandfather was not killed. Because my grandf real grandfather I never met had the land, had the money. Both grandfathers did. I never met the both sides, real biological grandfather. I only had the one grandmother I knew and uh, since I was little. And she's the one who babysat me. And she went through one year struggle sessions too because her, my real grandfather died in Sichuan Mountains. And uh, she remarried, second husband was a red worker. But uh, they found out you were second wife of this leader in like an outlawed, outlawed group leader in Sichuan Mountains. He must be killed as a county revolutionary, which were categorized all our families to be black. My grandma keeps saying, stick to her truth. She, say, she keeps saying, no, my dead husband was killed by his own people as a kind of part of our law group hmm. over some disputes. But after one year investigation, my grandmother, you know, went through that one year, somebody poked her back, standing up, apologized, dick, dick, write self-criticism, and uh, want her confess, confess, confess. She keeps saying, I have nothing to confess. I have a current husband who is a worker, red class. And uh, after one year investigation, God, thank goodness. Okay, you told the truth. Your husband was not county revolutionary. He was killed by his own man. Okay, now you are categorized as red class. That's why then we all become red. Okay. Otherwise, if you have one grandmother categorized black, the entire family is black. Unless one thing Mao urged young people to do, you can become red from black if you denounce your families. You come out publicly to say, my grandparents were born black, they were landlords, and I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm going to draw the line to denounce my families, I will change my last name, like from Tang to Wang, then I become red. Were a lot of people doing that? Oh, so many, so many. Because young people don't know. Young people were brainwashed and they were pressured. They also totally trusting the propaganda and the Mao was like a god. We, we say every day, long live Chiang Mai Mao. Hold a little read the books. Long live Chiang Mai Mao. Long live Communist Party. 10,000 years, double 10,000 years. I never challenge that. Like, is he God or is he human? No, I never ask that question. But we're just chanting every day. So the teenagers in the cities, urban youth, they were brainwashed, and they were pressured. If you don't denounce your family, change last name. You can never join Mao's students' organizations, like 
Young Pioneer wear red scarf, red card, Communist Youth member, and the Communist Party member wear all the jobs, best jobs. I hope for those uh, you know Communist uh, group members. And uh, today on Google, you can see this one guy is in his sixties now. My uncle generation goes to visit this torture site where he saw his mother tortured to death by red guards and apologized to say, Mom, I was 16, I did not know. I'm sorry, heartbroken. And I feel sorry for those people who did lost their families. Thank goodness I didn't do that, you know. And he never got married. He feels public guilty all his life. But I believed what the party wanted me to believe. Black families, enemies of the state, torture them, throw rocks at them, send them to labor camps. And uh, my, another horrible sight in my childhood memory is that Sorry about this. Do you have napkin? And uh, I saw black, black, class, black class people after struggle sessions in this public square going on military trucks. <laughs> they were going to get shot. I was scared to look at them to see they look so pale. And the red guards were saying, done with the black class enemies, long never shut my mouth. And with the soldiers behind those uh, people, I was told, after they show off to all the people, they're the enemies of state, they're gonna get shot. And the Chengdu had a public execution site. And uh, Sorry, those are two very, very scary and painful memories. And I do have a black and class friends. I never ask them the questions. And uh, I come to this country and met lots of those people living in the United States now tell me their family stories. And um, some lost family members, some committed suicide. How many people were do you think were executed that day well, in public? Well, 10 years, that, that day I saw probably four people were in the military trucks. But uh, according to the Communist Party official, official words, 20 million people were murdered. 20 million people. During the Mao's Cultural Revolution. Probably that also includes the one who could not handle struggle sessions, could not handle concentration camps, and uh, committed suicide. They were people who originally supported the party, intellectuals, scientists, professors, teachers, even the people who were um, kind of wealthy, but their young people supported the party. But then later, because the Mao's Cultural Revolution, all of a sudden, the party supporters become black class because they were born that way. See, that's another thing. You were born black, so you, you were guilty unless you change your last name, you denounce your family sometimes, and that is not enough. So they threw their supporters under the bus. I remember I watched this movie, black and white movie, called The Red. Read about this New Yorker, you know, like a reporter. The same thing. They they believe in communism until something horrible happened to yourself, make you ask questions. Oh, this is what I'm chasing. I'm believing now. I am the enemy myself. I I got uh, through into concentration camps, and. Uh, 
it just did not make sense. Some people couldn't handle it. They committed suicide. Even Deng Xiaoping's son, the leader of China, remember his one of his sons committed suicide during the Cultural Revolution. Jump off the building, become permanently handicapped. You know, lost his leg. I I hope history will never repeat itself. But unfortunately, the tragedies and the horrors of this Cultural Revolution is not being talked about, not being taught to our school kids, college kids. And、uh, how hard it is for me to them to see them waving a communist flag like Antifa kids, BLM kids. You know, BLM leaders come out to say we are trained Marxists. Do they even understand what that means? From my personal experience, what I had witnessed. It's what absolutely horror, and affect my life forever. But I did not know the truth. I was still chanting. I I had no idea about the truth until I came to this country. And there are lots of people living inside of China still don't know the truth. They still believe three years natural disasters, people starving to death, not Mao's communist central planning economical policies. Communism means government takes away all means of production, controls everything, from land to property, factories, natural, you know, resources, and and also media, schools, press, TV, radio stations. Everything is one party control. No judicial independence. All courts, all prosecutors, all teachers, all doctors, all reporters work. For the government, one-party control, even today. So why do we believe any numbers from the CCP today? Official numbers of economy, COVID cases, and all that. According, you know, about Taiwan, you cannot believe them because they, their numbers are official. But our media do quote them, and、uh, so I start to. I think ask questions. When Mao died, I was twelve. I was twelve, but I could not ask question publicly. We learned how to whisper, whisper to each other, with our neighbors, with our families. I I was always very inquisitive. I always ask. I saw people whispering each other, like neighbors in their apartment, and my families. I would sit there and I'm a little girl to say, "Oh, what are you talking about?" I would ask questions. They told me, "Shh, shh," very secretive because they're afraid what you talk about will be reported to authorities because the party had a block committees in every neighborhood. They called the Chinese Communist Party block committee. So they are in your neighborhood, and they know you. They know where you live. So you need to be careful what you talk about. So I was always、uh, tell, quiet. Don't ask question. You are just child. I, I did not understand that because I, you know, I was a red child. I was a class, you know, president, and and、uh, I was. I still had some brain left, I think, but. I I I start to ask question. Who lied to me? Mao was not God. He was a human. That's why he died. <laughs> I got that. We were not taught science at all.、Um, we we. I was so brainwashed that I could see Mao sometimes in the sky, talking to me, like he was smiling behind the clouds. I tell people it's like a, the you know the cartoon movie Simba look up and his father was talking to him you know it's like oh his mom was talking to me smiling, and we had to burn wood to heat up wok to do stir fry in our outdoor kitchen,、mm-hmm. and the mom in the flame, I would see his face smiling at me, 
because every day it's long never chant my mao. We sing songs every morning before we start a Chinese and mass to say my parents are dear, chant my mao is more dear, and uh, mao is the rising sun from the east. <laughs> All those revolutionary songs. So I was totally brainwashed. Even though I was a hungry child, but we were told we should be grateful. Taiwanese people were suffering. We need to go liberate them. America is an imperialist country. We need to defeat them. So nothing has changed. They're still doing that kind of propaganda today. But just with the internet, it's harder to tell people now. Taiwan people are suffering and are hungry. You know, think about. We lived on food rationing coupons. My parents and the two younger brothers, family of five, per my parents' official position inside the state factories, we had the minimum food rationing coupons to use per month. To give you an idea how much we ate, we were allowed to get the proteins. Proteins that may include all the eggs. All the meats doesn't matter, chicken, beef, or pork. But beef was just unreachable. I think the Chinese just we just had the pork to buy with our coupons, and two point eight pounds of protein coupons for a family of five a month. Um, two point eight pounds a month. Yes, you can have one day, one meal, family of five. So we were very, very hungry. As I said, I do not remember one single toy I had. When I had my birthday, people don't believe that. It's boiled egg. You were lucky to have a boiled egg that day. They save for you for your birthday. My mom was very sick, ill person. She was a premature baby with lots of problems. I'm the oldest out of three children, so I was treated as adult. Since I was six years old, people believe communism is free, offer free stuff. It's a lie. I was told by my parents and begged by my parents at the age of six when I was dying to go to school to learn how to read and write because my parents were illiterate. They begged me to stay home, to babysit my one-year-old infant brother. They could not afford his factory infant care. They could afford my next brother, younger brother, who is only seventeen months younger than me. When my grandma just couldn't babysit anymore, they put him in the childcare in my dad's factory, but. The infant care costs more money, and they they thought I was mature enough as a girl, as a big sister, to stay home babysit him. I I said no, 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 I want to go to school, but they begged me. They said, well, we'll buy you a, a foreign movie ticket as a bribe, and which is not your reason to do a foreign movie movie ticket, and then we need your help. We cannot afford it. We still have to buy food. I remember I just cried for three days. I want to go to school. And this, you know, what can I do? I said okay. I I took the movie ticket. <laughs> and uh, I watched the uh, Romania. I think fighting Nazis. And uh, loved the foreign movie, because that. When we were so pressed, we watched foreign movie. We saw foreigners in the movies, and especially we saw them hugging and kissing each other in the movies. It was like a, because in our culture, during most cultural region, we we don't show affections to each other, and、uh, we were not allowed to date. We are not allowed to wear pretty clothes, like. What I'm wearing today, a Chinese silk blouse, was banned because one of the four old,、hmm. old culture, custom, 
ideas and uh, habits. When red guards nodding door to door, people want to hide clothes like this or burn it and give away. Because if you get caught, you can go to struck sessions and go to labor camps because um, you are capitalist, you are black class, because you had old stuff like this. Everybody is supposed to look the same. Girls look like boys, approve hairstyles, approve they even, colors. They even approve your hairstyles? Yeah, I cannot lay my hair down like this past shoulder. So you see my old picture online as a young pioneer, red guards. You have to braid your hair. I have a piggy tails, ponytails, or short hair. You cannot lay down hair freestyle like this long. You must braid it, put up, you know. And, uh, but, uh, but I wanted to go to school anyway. So I had to stay home for a year. I watched for my baby brother. And uh, I was scared at the beginning um, because the uh, courtyard was very quiet. Under communist China, during Mao, you must work. Everybody must work. Include all women, all mothers. You cannot stay home to say, can I stay home with my babies? No. You have a guaranteed job with the state. But it's not up to you to choose what job, what position. You just must work. How do they decide where you're going to work? Everybody work for the state. So my mom worked for a local office supply factory in the neighborhood. My dad worked for a big steel production factory. That's subject to, you know, all the way to Beijing and government control. He was recruited. My dad was an orphan. He was recruited to work for them. They went to countryside, recruit young men who are very muscular. As I mentioned, my dad grew up as orphan. I never met my real grandparents from his side. Uh, he was illiterate. So he was managing one steam bound to another steam bound, starving all the time. So when they offered, recruit him to say, young man, you want to work for the new China? And um, we'll get you to cities and have salary. You have three meals a day. Of course he signed up. I think my dad was 17 or something. And he was an orphan since five years old, grew up on the farm, had to fight against bullies because he grew up as an orphan and no education. Because my real grandfather had some land and died of a strange disease where he spent all his wealth money to treat himself and still died. Then my grandmother died in the countryside, working on two part-time jobs to feed her children. And when she got bite by a dog, got infected, she had no money to, to treat her infection, and she died. So all six kids become orphans. And my, I never met um, all my mom, my dad's side family members because of... I think two sisters just basically sold and marry up off and to cook some food and, and marry somebody. And, and at a very young age, and my dad was a, kind of adopted by his uncle He because my dad was the youngest uh, and uh, his uncle did not have children. So they, I don't have money, but you can work on the farm and make some, you know, feed yourself. So my dad was working as the bottom of the workers, but my dad was strong and relatively smart, but no education. So Communist Party wanted to promote him and uh, get him join the party and uh, trying to make him a supervisor of the floor work. He couldn't do it. He said, I cannot read, I cannot do homework. They put him in workers' college. <laughs> he brought the homework home to say, can you help me do this? And uh, quickly he just gave up. He said, okay, I don't want promotion. I, I just want to go do my own cement concrete worker job and on the floor because I cannot be a, any kind of manager. But your food coupon is based on how much, you know, how high your position is. That's why we did not get much food. And I told people, we were so hungry. My uncle, when my grandmother was babysitting me to say, hey, there are some rats running around in my grandma's courtyard. And he set up a trap and uh, we got rat one day. One rat, and uh, he 
you know, put the red meat and skin it, meat on the fire, and we suck on the bones. Not much meat, of course, very little. But still, hey, it's something for you to suck on. But everybody learned to catch rats, and they ran out very quickly. You ran out of rats to eat. Yes. That's how bad it was. Yeah. Like today, I saw that today, you know, Venezuela, and people say that too. But we ran out. That's why when you're extremely poor, you don't have animals. Animals are gone. Birds shut down by the fishermen to eat. Dogs, cats did not exist. And uh, we had uh, one dog in our community, five, eight families, right? Here, one bathroom, eight families. One family had a dog. All the kids loved their dog. And uh, the police come in to say, it's illegal to have a dog. Either you kill it, eat it, or welcome come to get your dog and kill it. Maybe eat it too. So my neighbor had to, no choice. They, they, they put dog down and, um, and uh, ate the meat. We, as kids, we were very sad. And, and um, that was the only dog I knew, actually. <laughs> and and uh, later, I came to this country, I had, a, I had a pet, my first dog. And the thing is, so once I got to school, after one year babysitting, and uh, I was so motivated. I would be a best student, and I would do very well. I have good memory. And I was seven years old when I started school. But I made one critical mistake. I was a little bit too confident. See, only the best students got nominated to join Mao's and Yang Pai Lier, where you wear a red scarf. And the teachers were nominated best students called the three married students, politically correct, academic excellent, and the physically education, physically fit, called the three married students. Then you will get to be first one to join in a young pioneer, wear the red scarf. I met all those criteria. I was best student. I made 100% on every subject. I was very, very physically fit, doing all the physical education activities. I was a red child, and I was politically correct. So I thought I would be the first one to join in Mao's Young Pioneer, wear a red scarf, become a red scarf girl. It was such an honor, privilege to be the one who wear the red scarf. And, uh, but I was told by my teacher, somebody reported on you because you were bragging about yourself how wonderful you are, and you'll be the first one to wear the red scarf. We're not going to let you, because you are too confident. You are full of yourself, basically. Criticize me, full of myself, and too expressive. I was telling my girlfriend privately, I bet I'll be the first one to join. But she told on me. After that lesson, at the age of seven, I could not trust anybody. So you're not allowed to be proud of yourself? No. I was told by my teacher, we are a collective society. Everybody should fit in. Everybody should be the same. And uh, your self-expression of confidence, bragging about yourself, is a serious flaw. I, they, they say we're going to hold you back. You sh according to your grades, everything, you should be the first one joining, but we're not going to nominate you to join wear a red scarf just because what you said privately to your friend. I, I dare not to say anything. I complained to my parents. They were brainwashed too. They said the way we agree with you, teacher. See, Chinese have a traditional saying, the first bird flying out of forest get shot. So I was like a nail standing out, and you get a hammer down. So I learned my lesson. Do not trust anybody. 
at the age of seven in a one-party control state. Don't trust your neighbors. Don't trust your teachers. Don't even trust your family members. Because family members, some belong to Communist Party. What I mean, everybody is encouraged to come out to write diaries, to confess what you think yourself, also what you heard from your family members and your neighbors about anything not PC, politically correct. So if you hear anybody saying something challenging Mao or party, that's crime. Thought, crime existed. If you wear mouse, remember mouse, Chairman Mao's big button? Mm -hmm. called a, if you wear the upside down accidentally, it's crime. You can go to jail. If you hold the Chairman Mao's little red book to say long live Chairman Mao, but upside down, they think you are a little country revolutionary. Everything was about politics. It was in your face every day. There's no downtime. There's no off the grid living. And so you have to be very careful. I, it's like, it's hard to have any fun as a child. Our music has to be proved. Songs have to be all loyal to Mao and the party. And uh, every day, this uh, community housing, I lived there for 15 years, next to my junior high and high school, 6.30 in the morning, a big loudspeaker come on to say, time to get up, time to go work, time to go to school. Long live Chiang Mai Mao, long live Communist Party. Here's the news, it's all very high pitch noise. Have you heard about Peking Opera? Mao's wife created very political Peking Opera hmm. to sing red songs about Mao Party regime. It was awful. It was uh, using high pitch voice but singing red songs. So we had to hear that. Once a while, my so they would they would just have loudspeakers everywhere, and you'd be yeah, forced to they, listen to um, the propaganda all the school. time. Yeah, it's like a, you know, it's like when you see the Nazi movies, they have on the concentration camp. It's, but they don't have a twenty four hours day. And they they have in the morning, in the morning, they, time to get up, time to go to school. So you cannot sleep in. It was that way when I was in college. I was in college from 1981 to 1985. Long stop every morning. You could not sleep in. If you want to escape classes, uh, you just have to cover your ears. Once they turn it off and class already started, then you'd be quiet. Then you can go back to sleep. That's how, how bad it was. It's like, we, we, really, we, do, we really don't have any privacy. Don't have, so that's why... You, you keep everything, I learned, keep everything to yourself. Don't trust anybody. When I ask questions, it's like, a, by the way, I did have a couple crushes about my um, classmates in middle school, high school. You know, that's natural, right? But we are, we're not allowed to date. One boy in middle school, I was class president. He come talk to me. Oh no, the girl came talk to me to say, I'm so scared. What should I do? She received a love letter from him. And uh, basically he had a crush on her, a pretty girl in junior high. She got scared. She didn't know what to do. She come talk to me because my parents' apartment just next to the school. I was so brainwashed. I was so politically correct. Of course you know what to do. We're banned from dating. You give this letter to teacher. She did. 
And that boy never smiled again. He probably got a referral, went to private meetings, get criticized, probably even noted on his student file. Every child had a student file, secret. Your parents and yourself don't allow to see what's inside. That's how they track you. So if you get discipline action like this, then you will get a write up in your student file. And uh, of course, after I walk up this country, I feel guilty about what I did. I was a child. I did not know. And uh, she and uh, him just never smiled again. I don't know what happened to them privately. And uh, so we were not allowed to date. That's why you are not allowed to look pretty, look like a girls. And you know, I had to learn how to do makeup after I come to this country. I never learned how to do makeup. And uh, I think the most I did in college was a, a lipstick. And uh, of course, we're all young. We don't need the makeup, but but the thing is, though, everything is a bonjour lifestyle. If you do anything that Western people do, you will get criticized. So, clothes like this, approved hairstyle, no dating, and uh, once in a while, I hear a classic music. One minute during a news break on the radio, of government radio, all controlled by government. My neighbor, only one family out of eight, had a little radio. I said, "That's so beautiful." I heard the classic music, piano, during the news break. Every day that time, during the news break, a short time, there's a classic music. After all that revolutionary operas and red songs, and we 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 were deprived beautiful music. So I begged them, "It's dinner time." Can I come in to listen to next to the radio? Very close. I will not bother you eating dinner because we're too poor to have a radio. And they let me in, and I want to go there, just concentrate myself into listen to a, a classic, like a sometimes it's violin, sometimes piano, sometimes it's a symphony, very short. Oh, I I I don't know what it is. It was magic. And uh, my tears will come out, and I say, "Oh, this is beautiful, so beautiful! Oh, thank you so much, thank you so much!" And uh, so my entire childhood dream is like, "Dad, when can we buy a radio so I don't have to bother my neighbors and listen to it?" We never had a radio because my dad, mom were just not high enough, and uh, they were always in debt. Their entire life was in debt until I come to this country from my graduate school. R A research assistantship job, five hundred dollars a month. I saved the money. I helped my parents to pay off their debts. And、um, and my dad said, "Well, why do you need a radio? You have loudspeaker every day for news. And I need to go to work. I need to save money for a bicycle, a used bike." My dad is very hardworking. My mom is sick all the time, so we all rely on my dad. And、uh, he will get up early in the morning, go catch public bus, and bus were always so crowded, and、uh, so people will fight to get on. Two times, two times, my dad told me he got locked down to the floor, lying down there, and、uh, and bus drive by his ears. One time he come home really pale. He said, "I could be killed this morning," and.、Uh, Cause、uh, I got locked down, and by the stronger people fighting to get on the bus to go to work, and、uh, you could lose your job and if you don't show up work on time. You, you everybody had to fight and get up real early in the morning. So my dad's dream is to have a a used bike, and、uh, a a a little fan in the summer to blow air. Cause I he saw me doing homework, I would sweat like a little pig, just like a. Covered with sweat on my face, and、uh, they said, "You know what? Those are two priorities. I get myself used bike, or get your little fan to blow air in the summer for you to do homework." Because I was a good student, and、uh, my dad was very proud of me. So, so I never had a radio, and、uh, my dad did get his used bike, and later、uh, he had to borrow money to get me a little fan from my uncle. And、uh, you know, pay back gradually later. And when say 
when people say they don't understand when they want the socialism or communism, look what kind of life we had it was a probably unbelievable primitive poverty that people in this country will never know the details about it. And uh, as I said, I got a frostbite and uh, I even did not know about back to the bear fat story I mentioned to you earlier, but I don't remember it. What happened, my dad spent lots of money to get a bear fat. It's a super station. If you get a bear fat, like a really fat, like a bacon, right? Bear fat is from bears and put on my and fingers in the winter were all so red and swollen and uh, and like frostbite. Nay, it will go away, it will help. And of course you can also use to fry food and to make a, you know, like a Chinese food stir fry. So he got them and uh, he just sitting there and uh, I did not know I did not recognize it was something valuable. I, I saw it was some trash in a little, you know, jar or something. And uh, I'm the one who threw away, but I don't remember that. So so I was proper punished by my dad. But it's like last year they told me, you did it. You threw away, not, not your two younger brothers. If my baby brother, who is five years younger, remember that, he must be right because he's five years younger. I don't remember it. I threw under the rock. I don't know what happened. I must be too painful, too traumatized. And, uh, but my dad, bless his heart, you know, very hardworking. And uh, because uh, my dad had too much pride, too much human dignity, he would not put up with his Communist Party boss in his state factory. So when they, treat him like dirt, like an animal, and the punting table, my dad, that kind of guy, will punt table back. And they're trying to get rid of him for many years. And uh, I remember in the 80s, um, late 70s, they said, uh, hey, Mr. Tang, we want to send you to countryside to work. Remember, everybody worked for the state. Mm -hmm. If they want to send you to go some work, it's not family package. You go there work by yourself. It's very common back then. Families are separated. So my dad could go to this countryside work. It's like a one, it's like a take two whole days bus to go there and to work. Maybe come home visit once a year or something. My mom will be home with three babies. My dad refused to go. Say, boss. My wife is a premature baby, very sick all the time. I got to stay close to my three kids. They rely on me to take care of them. And my wife goes to the hospital all the time. And uh, so he said, uh, I cannot go. And then they always try to fire him. So finally, as soon as he turned on it, like a, I think about 45 or something, they call the early retirement to say, no more job anymore, retire earlier. And uh, my dad thought, you know what? If I retire earlier, I could start my own business. That was after Cultural Revolution, under Deng Xiaoping, people are allowed to have their own business, like even straight vendor business. My dad is very handy, mechanical. Oh, I can fix bicycle, I can fix tricycle. He said, okay, I would take early retirement instead of going to countryside to work. My wife and kids left alone. And that way I can just make more money even because he can work longer hours too. And they will not give him a state license. You require city license to have a business on the street to fix people's bicycles. So my dad said, well, why? Because you are a retired worker, you have a salary. We need to get a license to other people who don't have any jobs at all. My dad said, that's not right. My salary is barely keep my family fit. We have family of five. My wife is sick all the time. I need to make extra money. And my dad is such a man with dignity. He did not figure out. He needed to come up with lots of cash to bribe. If he did the bribe, he might get his license, but instead, 
He was just a man of integrity. He did not do it. He just did it illegally. So he worked in the so-called black market. He worked at night to fix people's bicycles. He also fixing bicycles was a black market occupation. <laughs> Wow! I know you cannot imagine that, and、uh, because they refuse to give you license by the city officials, it's called a Chen Guan. They were their government, and、uh, so my dad actually later and、um, fixed a tricycle. So people who that time, if you carry passengers around inside the city when people need the transportation, right? Not everybody had a bicycle or want to use bicycles. So he would. You know, transport passengers. Come on, then you get in, and、um, he will. He's strong. So tricycle. Then two passenger can sit on the back. And my dad did that illegally, and、uh, he got robbed many times. And one time, um, somebody beat his、uh, nose, broke his nose, bleeding, and and he ran to the hospital. Could not call cops. How can you call cops if you're working illegally, right? I mean,、mm. they the government confiscated his his tools, his tricycle before, so he dare not to report, and they took all his money, all his cash too. Then he would just manage to borrow money, and start over again. Get a, you know, and he said, that, you know, no matter how hard it is, how dangerous it is, but it's still money. That's why. That's why you know I would say. The government regulations take people's rights to make a living away and sell back to you. <laughs> It's called a occupational license here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but my dad, that's how he 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 worked like this for many years to put me through college. Remember, to go to college, even though the government recruited me at the age of seventeen when I. Passed the college exam, nationalized college exam, and、uh, I was a red child. My file all very politically correct, no problem with family, and the best score. And、uh, I was、uh, I wanted to go to study law because, as I said, I started to ask questions. I need to search for truth, and、uh, but then, where did I get the food money? My dad hard earned money. Cash from、uh, illegally working in the evenings of the street to give me food every month, food money every month when I was in college, four years from when I was seventeen to twenty-one. Wow. That is unfathomable. Yeah, and the people say, "Well, you were red class." You could have good life in communist country because you were workers. Workers rule. That's what the, you know, Karl Marx said. The workers rule. The great proletarian cultural revolution under Mao. Everybody suffered. Everybody. You, if you are on top of the one percent, you're okay. I'm sure Chairman Mao had all the meat he wanted, and dated all the other women, played with、uh, as many women. As he wanted, according to his private doctor's book, the private life of Chairman Mao, because he was a god, he was an emperor, and he can do whatever he wanted. And we could not even look pretty, we could not date, and could not make a living. And the Mao had a famous saying: If someday everybody in China can eat. Roasted beef in soy sauce with potatoes, then communism would be fully fulfilled. Just afford to eat that dish. I can eat that dish every day. Even later, after China's economic reform, my relatives could afford that dish better than in the past. You know, and China economy got better not because of communism is because the economic reform opened up, and.、Uh, It basically adopted free market capitalism a little bit, but with still central controlling and planning, and、uh, then the economy just took off. But that's what they sell you communism. Tell you, we're gonna give you free healthcare, free childcare, free education, 
and give land back to their peasants. That's what the Communist Party promised, Mao promised to all the Chinese before 1949. And uh, that's when, remember, they were fighting Japanese first. Actually, most time was the Nationalist Party. Chiang Kai-shi's government called uh, that time, remember, was a Republic of China. That was actually the government before the Communist government called the Republic of China under Kuomintang Nationalist Party. They did most of fighting against Japanese. And Mao was recouping, reorganizing, and, uh, and then later had the civil war. You know, Communist Party fighting Nationalist Party, and uh, the Nationalist Party left. So Republic of China um, gone to Taiwan. And, uh, and people don't know the history to say, oh, Taiwan is a part of China. If you really study history, that's not true. Taiwan was under Japan for many years. Taiwan was an island. When Chiang Kai-shek had to flee China, and then they went to Taiwan. And many years later, Taiwan became a democracy more than one party dictatorship. And uh, because Chiang Kai-shek died and his son became the president and the transition to democracy and free country and become one of the four dragons, we call the little Asian dragons, four of them, you have uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, and uh, what is another, that time Hong Kong, when Hong Kong was under British rule. Very good economy, but, but they're trying to indoctrinate all the mainland Chinese for years. We got to go liberate Taiwan. And uh, they use a patriotic education trying to push down on Hong Kong students who were subject to British rule for many years, who resisted centralized education, indoctrination by Beijing. That's how the Hong Kong students had umbrella movement, like 2013, 2014, led by students. And the Joshua Wang, now in the jail, after 2019, the Hong Kong protest against the China's imposing national security laws. So Hong Kong is gone. And uh, people got to realize who are the enemies of communists. It's the people who believe in freedom, democracy, separation of the powers, judicial independence. They hate them. So they hated Hong Kong, they hated Taiwan, and they hate it. They still hate America. If you look at China's propaganda today inside of China through CCTV, they're not propaganda and basically demonize America. I have a Chinese girlfriend in North Carolina she married to an American citizen. Her family told her in, chi in China, her family in China told her, do not come home with, with him, with your American husband. He's not welcome. That tells you today, CCP, how much propaganda that is to brainwash its people. It's very sad that the 1.4 billion Chinese are enslaved but always consent. They were under zero COVID lockdown, testing every day, no food for 10 weeks. My friends were starving in Shanghai, trapped inside their apartment for 10 weeks. They had the money, but they could not go out, stay home. Their doors were burned, barbed wires on the community building stairs. You could not get out, totally disarmed. Even under lockdown like that, and people still support it. Lots of them still supported the party. Can you believe that? My family in China have no idea what I'm saying here. If they knew, they probably would criticize me. My uncle who went to countryside, my three uncles went to countryside for 10 years after Mao finished using the young people red guards in the cities and they will become violent. 
they were fighting each other on the streets. And the generals told Mao to say, you got to do something with those young people. He started another campaign. Down to the mountains. Get a re-education by the peasants. Send them away to the countryside. You have no choice as parents. You can keep one kid, youngest, stay home. So my grandparents, my grandmother, and my step-granddad, they only got to keep my aunt at home, youngest. All three uncles sent to countryside for 10 years. And you are allowed to come home once a year. That's it, once a year? Yes. My grandma cried every time when my uncles, my especially my favorite second uncle came home. I always want to see him. He was sent to the um, rural countryside near Burma, you know, in southwest China. And uh, grandma will always cry when he leaves. I remember I was uh, still in elementary school. I gave him nine pennies. I had nine pennies. <laughs> Saved up from Chinese New Year or something. I say, oh, uncle, you'll be gone. I only see you once a year. Here, take this. He cried too. Okay, and uh, he come home, no wife, no job, no skill, no high school diploma. And only were allowed to come home if you're single. If you get married in the countryside, your household registration will be in the countryside. If you marry somebody in the countryside, you were not allowed to come back to the cities. For that reason, none of my uncles took a wife from 17 to 27. And he came home, had to rent on friends to arrange to meet somebody to get married. Because you have nothing, you don't know anybody, then time is running out. He had to start to date people. Then subject to one child policy, he had one child, my, my, my cousin. So, but a lot of those generation people though, red guards, some of them still not awake because you don't know the truth. They were talk about their life, they were laugh about it. My uncle's very bitter, but still they don't know the truth. I have my family ask me, to mow Mao's death every December on his birthday. Mao died in 1976. He's wow. a mass murder. But my family say, let's take one minute to have a memorial for him. Human sorrow, human tragedy. And uh, I really, I just become speechless. I cannot tell them when did the one-child policy start? <clears throat> in the 80s. In the 80s? Yeah. When under Mao, it's kind of weird. Under Mao, Mao said, uh, be a mom is glorious. Have as many kids as you want. I remember my Chinese teacher had nine kids. No birth control. Because he said, uh, we got to show the world. We have lots, lots of people. And... Uh, I heard he had no compassion when people crying, holding his hand, kiss his hand, telling him about poor families. He no smile and no laughter. When people told him during a, a so-called mass famine, like uh, people are starving to death, he had no reaction. We got lots of people. Yeah, 20 million, no big deal, or something like that. I don't know if it's true or not. It's very scary that somebody like that, people worship him like a god. But he has no, he has no respect to human life. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, he died. And the Communist Party had a new leader. And they wrote into law, say, push for one child policy because the China economy was just about to collapse completely. And uh, after Mao's death, and uh, Deng Xiaoping said, uh, let, let, let some people get rich first. Let's reboot our economy. And uh, 
And it's also country population growth. They blame bad economy on too too big population. Too many people. Yeah, too many people. Instead of it's your political ideology, your system completely failed. Well, people in this country may say that's not real communism. <laughs> you know how many people have to die to prove to you real communism, socialism works. One hundred million people died in one hundred years under communism. How many experiments do you want? So, yeah. if they know the real history, if they know they what happened. To us during Mao's Cultural Revolution, you would think history should not repeat. But today's China is already in Cultural Revolution 2.0. The Chairman Xi wants to have common prosperity. So that's why you look at his policies that the uh, he took over basically lots and lots of private, huge industries and companies. A billionaire, Jack Ma, was forced to retire, also disappeared for a few months because he dared to criticize China regulators on the economy. Didn't didn't the CEO of Alibaba disappear too? That's him, Jack Ma. That's him. That's okay. him, Alibaba CEO, and his company also was told. Cannot go public in Hong Kong. Say, how could a private company get so rich? It's of course there's a power struggle. I heard that the uh, you know lots of companies billionaires got rich under Jiang Zemin, the you know former president, and Jiang's faction and the Xi's faction are constantly fighting each other to gain power to gain control. So when Chairman Xi came to power, two thousand. Twelve, it's ten years now. That's why he's subject to another third term coming in the fall. He changed the China Constitution to allow unlimited presidency. But when he become, he's the one that changed that. Well, so called voted by ninety nine percent nine ninety nine percent and and you know people of Congress, which is rubber stamp people's Congress. China's constitution says ch all Chinese parties are under dictatorship of China's Communist Party. Read that. So, but under Deng Xiaoping, he did say we should have term limit. So then, limit himself to two terms or five years, ten years. And same thing happened to Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin. But she come to power. He got rid of that, so people should know that. Why? He has. We call him a, a new Mao. New Mao. He's that bad. He's a hardcore communist, and uh, so they even celebrities were quiet now in China. All the YouTubers, celebrities, famous actresses, actors, and billionaires and millionaires got rich from a past China's、um, limited free market capitalism and allow private industries and private enterprises, and、um, and they were kind of staying low file, keep their head down now, and、uh, sometimes they disappear. China is famous. For disappearing people, in my row house, community housing courtyard, I heard two neighbors disappeared. Their family never find out what happened to them. I don't know what happened. I was a child, but my dad told me, "Yeah, they're gone. They went to business trip. They're just gone." And the people still disappear today in China. And there are dark prisons called. The Prisoners of conscience and、uh, human rights lawyers. If you practice human rights as a career, as a lawyer, that's a very dangerous career for you to have in China. If I stay in China, I could be in jail too by saying what I'm saying. And、uh, 
Because I thought when you go study law, is really to protect people, to promote justice and equality. No, I was told in law school that law is a tool for the party to use to govern the masses. So all the Chinese people just masses. I was depressed. So remember, I was I was asked question at twelve years old. At at seventeen, I went to law school. I was asking question again. So I wanted to study law to help my country to become a society rule of law. And I heard my professor telling me that. Then I got depressed again. I was lost a soul for two years after Mao's death, and now I was lost in law school. <laughs> What should I do in with my life? So I become rebellious teenager. That's my awakening started happening. Is a、uh, I become rebellious teenager in college, <laughs> and we were subject to department education mandates. So when I first went to law school, nineteen eighty one, which is college degree for four years. And they ban us also from hair laying down. Still, ban dancing parties, and the ban blue jeans. Blue jeans is Western lifestyle. Cannot wear blue jeans to go to school campus. And、uh, but we were rebellious. We didn't care so much. So we would just constantly had our hair wet, and、uh, it's like, oh, my hair is wet. I just had shower. I cannot put up. I need to get dry. So here lay down, pass your shirt. We're constantly fighting with the.、Uh, You know, guards at the gate because my dormitory was outside, and、uh, so eventually、um, we got a boombox to play music on the hallway of the dormitory. Dormitory lights shut off at 10 p.m. As adults, college students, we had a curfew. 10 p.m. All the lights came off. 10 p.m. So as college kids, we could not sleep, and we were learning how to dance in the hallway. With a boombox, little like cassette, play cassette, play dancing music to practice our footsteps, you know, and、uh, because we had to run into a、um, dormitory bathroom at night, it's one location in the hallway, so they had to keep the lights on in the hallway. And、uh, one year later, finally, it,、um, they said, "Okay, you can have dancing parties now." The eighties was like China's cultural renaissance. Remember that needs to Tiananmen Square, nineteen eighty nine students protest. We had a、uh, Hu Yaobang as the China's new premier. He wanted to have a political reforms, besides economic reforms under Deng Xiaoping, to say, you know, Chinese people should decide what kind of country, what kind of political system they should have. He did not even say two party system. He did not say overthrow the Communist Party. He just said we should discuss that. Maybe we should talk about democracy. Then he got marginalized. He lost his position. When I was,、uh, I think, at that time,、uh, in the eighties, and、uh, that's another story about that leads to Tiananmen Square massive peaceful protest. But I was in college. Oh, now we can have dancing parties, and I, we can wear whatever we want to, and、uh, our pictures transitioned from black and white to Kodak color film. <laughs> All the street vendors were selling Kodak color film, and I started to wear very bright, colorful clothes. And I was told not to in in, in high school and middle school, and、uh, and I went to dancing parties almost every weekend. And、uh, I learned disco, like、uh, we're twenty years behind.、Uh, but we studied, we we learned disco, and you just just be able to shake your booty, shake your body any way you see fit with very fast beat music. We feel sense of、uh, liberation, sense of、uh, freedom. Oh, that was the best time. Of my life in college up to that point, and、uh, I did skip classes. 
because I lost interest in the legal system they wanted me to study. And、uh, I was very interested in foreign students and faculties on campus. There were some exchange students, and we invite them to our parties. So all private party inside the dormitory, and、uh, ask them, "Hey, what are your country like? What are your country like?" My English was very bad; I I couldn't understand much. But the one American student changed my life. Um, he met me at a dancing party. He said, "Lily, I want to show you something from America," and gave me his、uh, student exchange building address. I went to visit him, and、uh, all foreign students and buildings, and、uh, have guard. All Chinese students will have guards. All buildings have guards, security guards. <laughs> Nobody is like a, a old lady or man retired, watch everything. So I had to go fill it up. Who I'm going to visit? Time in, time out. What I'm going to talk about, and where's my address? What major I have as college student? So I went to his room. I thought I was going to. I had no idea what to expect. You know, something from America. Cool, awesome. And he actually showed me a pocket constitution. He said, "Have you heard of this?" I said, "No." And he, I said, "My English is not good," but he read to me. I remember. Oh, I remember. My English is good enough to remember that all men are created equal. And、uh, I, I said, "This is your founding document. What do you mean?" And he told me that Lily, it doesn't matter. You are Chinese. You are woman. You have yellow skin. Say our founding fathers in America believe all humans are born equal, and they are children of God. Your rights come from your Creator, not from any government. You, by being you, have individual right. I've never heard of that before. I was getting emotional when I talk about this. I say. My light bulbs came on. I say I'll come back. <laughs> I saw our talk was so fascinating. I say I'll come back, and、uh, so I went back another time. And、uh, because my English just wasn't good enough, and then he went through a couple more with me, Bill of Rights, and、uh, I learned, hey, I have an individual right from first session. So second time when I go back to visit him, I did not register. <laughs> I said, "Well, I have a right. I have right to talk to this person. Why should I register? Tell them what we're talking about, and let them to track me. I have some common sense that they don't want. They don't like this. I can get into trouble by telling them what I'm talking about. So I basically just、uh, the lady has to go to the bathroom." Pour tea, just watch out, right? When she's gone temporarily, I just tiptoe run upstairs, and and the tiptoe run down. It makes good movie someday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and、uh, and I just remember he told me all those rights, speech, religion, and the press, assembly, and the Second Amendment right. I was very impressed. Really, really, you have this. Oh, I just thought this country is awesome. So I still could not understand lots of stuff, and I just remember those rights. I say this country would be awesome for me to come someday, if I have to give up on China. He puts America into my head, and the individual rights will never go away. So that they come, I graduated. I wanted to see Shanghai so bad because I don't want to go back to my home province. It's very isolated, next to Tibet, Sichuan province, and not many foreigners there. Most important, Shanghai is international open commerce city. That you have more foreigners, you have more business, and and of course,、uh, I wanted to stay in my same law school to teach. That's the only way 
I can stay in Shanghai. We did not have a job market. When you graduate, everybody get a sign job. And I'm supposed to go back where I come from. I had to make lots and lots of extra efforts to to ask, please, please, can I stay in Shanghai? Can I get a? We were the first graduating class at the law school class, so we had five positions out of sixty students, and I wanted to ask for one of them for me to stay in Shanghai, and. I think I might be the only two, one of the two students from outside of Shanghai get that job because most of them just maybe stay in Shanghai or something, and and uh, but it, so it, it takes extra effort, and uh, so so they say well, you you are very very sociable, you have good personality, maybe you can stay in Shanghai, teach part time and manage law firm on campus part time. And、uh, because China was、uh, rebooting the economy and start to go international, and in 1985, under the opening up reform, so so all the law school graduates naturally can practice law because、uh, we're so short of people. Remember, colleges are closed under Mao, so we're the first graduating class. Now they probably require you have master degree or PhD to teach. So I was lucky to say. Okay, with my bachelor degree, I can teach and I can be lawyer, and I loved my law firm job because my academic dean is expert on international law. So he and I would go travel to、um, some big companies to consult with them, and I can be his assistant, and also receive clients at our law firm on campus. But my teaching job, I love the students, but. I had to be academically、um, restricted. There's no academic freedom. You need to teach what is、uh, allowed and PC. And so I was told that、uh, be careful with your students. My people don't understand China universities or schools. They need to understand now. We have two lines of supervision. So every department on campus. Has Communist Party committee and academic dean, and you have a president, chancellor of university. Then you have a party secretary. Who has more power? It's party secretary. So my department, you know, like a committee chair, is very powerful. So so we have to, in order to teach in law school, you must join the party. Otherwise, they question your loyalty. So I was、uh, put on probational status for a year on the party to see how I behave, how I, you know, be politically correct. But as I said, because I was fighting with my Communist Party and committee boss to worry about my lifestyle. What is lifestyle? Anything you to you do you are doing with your personal freedom time,、yeah. <clears throat> it's a lifestyle problem. He always say I have lifestyle problem, means I went to dancing parties with my friends, with my even some of our students are like when you're I mean I was twenty one right, twenty two there when you're younger, and、uh, then and I was、uh, dating a boyfriend from Shanghai. And、uh, I was visiting his parents' home in Shanghai with his parents' invitation. Even share a a bed with、uh, you know their daughter. And my party boss told me I have a lifestyle problem. I said, "Well, I said, well, I said, professor, what if your daughter is in out of state? You know, you would love to for her to have a host family to go to." Have a home meal, cause my family are so far away, and、uh, but she said、uh, you should not go to visit people's families before you marry them. You know, it's like a the constant like bother you what you do with your free time, and then what you teach in the classrooms. So within the first year of my law school faculty member, I was、uh, fighting him, and、uh, and that's when I think I kind of decided. Maybe China is not for me. I was not happy. 
I was oppressed, and、uh, I cut my hair short. I wore suits all the time, trying to look more mature. And、uh, you see some pictures I took. I I really was depressed third time, and after I become assistant professor of a prestigious law school in Shanghai. But so what? I wasn't happy. I was、uh, feeling oppressed. Can I imagine I go through my life like this for the rest of my life? I I just couldn't. My friends who left China come to United States, mail me pictures. That was like a eighty six, eighty seven that time. I saw beautiful, an American you know rural country and animals and cows and farms and and、uh, he he said my friend said.、Uh, America will suit your personality very well because I'm happy and sociable, you know, very assertive. And he said, "You should come here because he can sense I was I'm I'm really depressed at time." So he encouraged me. Say, "Hey, just apply for some graduate school." So I start to apply for graduate school. I quickly realize if I want to come to America, I need to change my strategy right now because. I need to get the permission to quit my job. If you don't get the permission to quit, you have to pay back all your past year salaries. <laughs> oh, and you need the permission <clears throat> from your leaders to go apply for private passport. Then I have to get a visa. So I said, "Oh, if I'm going to set my heart now to really escape China for good, how am I going to get permission to leave if I keep?" Kind of fighting with my boss, so I start to sell my lips, go to political study meetings weekly, and speak up, support the party because I used to sit on there just quiet, and then they can tell me, they can tell that I was challenging them in silence by not saying anything, by look at their face and look into their eyes, and、uh, so I have to change all that strategy. To create a different kind of perception, in order to leave, I got a I met an American、uh, professor on college campus, and I asked him to sponsor me. Say I need to get out of China. Can you help me? I need an American citizen is willing to sponsor me because I don't have money. I don't have family and friends. How I'm gonna allow to even get an enrollment acceptance and without scholarship or without money? How I'm gonna support myself? I I not not like other Chinese students. They all come here study math, science, engineering. They can get a scholarship. I study law in China. I could not get into law school, so I just want to go to graduate school for any social study majors. And and my English was bad, so my sponsor actually told me, I will sponsor you, but I also I get you help with one graduate school. The dean was my next door neighbor. So, so next door labor was the dean of the School of Social Work in UT Austin, Texas. So, I said yes, please help. And、uh, my English is not good. I cannot pass GRE. I can barely pass TOEFL. TOEFL is like a any foreign student must pass an English test to be accepted by stud by colleges. Okay. Yeah. So, so I got waived the GRE, which is a graduate school test. And to say we'll waive that, and we'll lower your TOEFL exam, and、uh, I will be your sponsor, so you could go get a, a enrollment, a notice, and get accepted. Then when you apply for passport and a visa, you also have to show those、uh, all those financial paperwork. And、uh, so, I went to、um, the、um, passport local police station seven times. Before I went that, I went to my party boss. I got accepted by a graduate school. Can I please, please, quit my job and go to apply for my passport? He said, "Well, consider your performance in the past years pretty good, and uh, uh, but you still need to sign an agreement." He made me to sign an agreement to say, "After your master degree is done." Even on your own time, on your own money, did not cost me one penny. You need to come home to serve your country. Okay, and、uh, 
Or if you don't come back, there will be two consequences. Number one, we're going to kick you out of CCP. I said, no problem. <laughs> I was forced to join in order to have a teaching job in the school. Number two, it's kind of tough. Number two, they will send my household registration personnel file back to Chengdu, back to Chengdu, where I grew up, I was born, my hometown, because Shanghai is the first tier city, Chengdu is the second tier city, capital of Sichuan. To go from second tier to first tier city, it's very difficult, even today. You are tracked by your household registration. If you don't, if don't have legal status in one city, you don't get the benefits. So if they kick my file all back to Chengdu, that means if I fail in this country, I do go back to China, and I cannot go back to Shanghai. I have to go back to Chengdu to get a job there. And uh, I hesitated for one minute. I signed it, said no problem. I, uh, I will stick to the agreement. But in my heart, I said, uh, I better make it. Otherwise, I have to go back my hometown, go back where I started <laughs> yeah. and uh, where I was born. And uh, so then my sponsor lent me money, applied, you know, uh, to have a visa and apply, I mean, for graduate school and uh, bought me an air ticket to fly to the United States. I remember when I got a visa after three tries, and everybody was shake hand with me and touch my hair uh, because there were so many students lining up, long line to get visa. Once you get a visa, they feel like uh, you, one foot, it's already in the US. So they want to touch your hair and to feel the good luck, to give them some good luck so they can get a visa next time. Oh, they said, oh, congratulations, touch my hair, said that you, one foot is already in the US. And I was smiling too, I was so happy. So, because all I need now is the air ticket. And of course, we, um, we have to go health screening, you know, do whatever legal way required by the US and for student visa. And, uh, and, I, then I, and I flew for the first time, I actually flew home from Shanghai to Chengdu to say goodbye to my families, to say, you know, um, dad, I, I, will, I don't worry about finances. I will get rich. I will help you pay off for your debts. And my parents were in debt. That's why I had to raise, I had to raise $100 for my friends. $1 equal lots of Chinese yen. So it's like a, several friends gave me the money. I, you know, I write down and I will pay you back with interest. I need the money. My parents had no money. I also raised money for my trip back home first time take this airplane trip, so quicker, I didn't have time. And, uh, and my dad was crying, you know, this is the second time he lost his salary. He lost salary before. When you get paid, they give you cash and somebody could rob you. And uh, when you take a bus or something, and uh, he was so afraid to tell my mom to say, I cannot tell your mom, she'll get so mad, she'll get so sick, she might pass out. And I said, Dad, don't worry, I will help. So I used some money I raised, gave to my dad, and paid my own way back to Shanghai, raised more money. So by the time I come to United States, 1988, May 11th, I had $100, five $20 bills, all borrowed. And, uh, and uh, later I discovered I was in the hole with my sponsor, $1,200 in debt to him because he write down all the expenses for me to apply for graduate school, air tickets and all that. And I promised to pay him back. And I, I couldn't speak English. But when I arrived at Austin, Texas, um, after like two stopovers, one was in Japan. And the first time I get out of China, like within like a two hours, I was in Tokyo airport. It was like a totally different world. I just remember Japanese people were so polite and so clean there and constantly ball, you know. <laughs> I was doing the same thing. Then I stopped by Denver. From Denver, I saw the Rocky Mountains, so beautiful. 
and then I flew over Austin, Texas, and my sponsor and they picked me up. The picture you saw, my first day in America at Austin Airport with a huge, big smile, and that was the one he took. I'm very grateful he took that, otherwise I will have nothing to show for it. But I was uh, so, so happy. Up to that day in my life, I will always call that, and that was my happiest day in life. You know, up to that day, which is two months and before my 24th birthday. Wow. Now we can take a break. <laughs> you want to take a break? Yeah. Let's take a break. Yeah, take a break, drink water, use bathroom, and um, because now we're going to focus on what happens to me after I started my new life in this country, right? Yep. And, and the, the same, so that was 34 years ago. So that's a long time. Yeah, and, but the first 20 years, I was, not, I was just learning, learning, learning. I was not political. I was not totally awake. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, see, that's the weakening process, yeah. I love to talk about my meat. And so what I'd like to do right now is show everybody what I'm packing. Don't get too excited, ladies, because I'm talking about Good Ranchers. You see, Good Ranchers has premium meat cuts. So, how many of you are tired of going to the grocery store and you look at the meat aisle and it's empty or it just looks like garbage? Because that's what it is, it's garbage. That's why you get Good Ranchers. It gets mailed, you get meat, premium meat, mailed right to your front door. So ladies, you can get excited about that. Who doesn't want meat mailed right to their front door? Like on, on call, literally on delivery. Anyways, comes to your door. They're all individually packaged like this. Some good looking meat, right? Throw it in the freezer. You thaw them out. You never run out of meat for dinner. So, so you can have meat every single night. That's right, carnivores. So what I need you to do is go to goodranchers.com slash Sean. You're gonna get $30 off your first order and they're gonna ship you your meat for free. It's like a dream come true. So anyways, once again, go to goodranchers.com slash Sean and get your meat shipped to your front door today. I remember going back behind the window, I reload another magazine and as soon as I pop out to shoot, it all goes black. The brutality of it all and really what we were up against, I had no left or right lateral limit to even comprehend that. The body mutilations, the beheadings, the dismemberment, the... The human shields. All that. But the night prior, my platoon commander comes in and he's like, everyone's gonna write a, their death letter. Jesus Christ. And then you hear stories of your friends that you went to boot camp with, the School of Infantry with, that are in Ramadi, that are fighting for their life at the same time that you're fighting for your life in Fallujah just to find out how those dudes are dead. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember the feeling. And I have never been able to shake it ever since. That's when I had this out-of-body experience. At the time, I had no idea what happened. I thought I was dead. I saw this top-down view of what was going on. I could see my body. I could see my point man still shooting. I could see my other teammates on the ground. We were stacking so many bodies that we had to send patrols out to move the bodies because they were interrupting our fields of fire. Holy shit. There were so many bodies being stacked that the locals were driving up their ambulances and picking up bodies also. All right, Lily, we're back from the break. We just got to the part where you got to the U.S. and you've been here for a little bit. And But I wanted to ask a question. What was, if there was any, was there any propaganda any negative propaganda toward the United States that they were telling you about before you made the trip to Austin, Texas? 
Um, when I was growing up as a child, um, of course, China was close to the world. So every day, and um, um, I think uh, America uh, supposed to be an imperialist country. And uh, there I saw cartoons, I saw posters and on the walls and, and talk about defeat American imperialism all the time. Yeah. Um, and of course, after China's opening up and Americans start to do business in China, foreign capitals come in, and then and that kind of demonization reduced. I remember my first um, American movie I watched, I liked very much, was translated into um, Chinese. It was like a Gang Wen Ziwen <laughs> about the Civil War. And uh, John Denver, um, yeah. I feel so sad when he died. He was uh, um, singing all the country and folk songs and beautiful voice. And Why would they let you come to the U.S. if we're an impure country? Well, remember um, when China opening up and, uh, and they started to allow an um, exchange students programs so the foreign students are able to go to China and uh, and Chinese students were able to apply for schools in the US that was the beginning of the international exchange um, programs um, so but you had it was not easy you had to apply you had to get permission to leave so as a result there were also um, student scholars were, sent overseas to study on government money. So some of those, we have to be careful. Some of those were tied to the CCP, work for the government. They went to universities, laboratories, and and so we have to be careful with that. But at the beginning, though, China was a folk song, reboot the economy. Okay. Because they were less focused on political ideology. And when Deng Xiaoping said... Uh, no matter, you know, if you're a black cat or white cat, if you can catch a mouse, you're a good cat. That means uh, let some people get rich first. So my neighborhood, the first guy who ever left the state factory job was a young man who said, I'm going to start a restaurant. And he was the first one got rich in my poor neighborhood. He worked day and night on his restaurant. He was the first one bought a motorcycle besides everybody was still riding bicycles. <laughs> and later he built a kind of little bit more um, modern um, housing for his parents uh, in the countryside. By the time I went to college and uh, he was the only one who had the money to give me a gift, a little pink long sleeve shirt. I wore that shirt because it was brand new clothes I got and to walk into my college campus, 1981. Oh. Yes, I remember, I don't know where he is today. <clears throat> I'm always lost in touch. But I remember that very, very well. The brave entrepreneurs, Chinese, who left the government guarantee job to start their own business, and they got rich quick. Because okay. China was just wide open, no private entrepreneurs who were doing all kinds of business. So that just picked up rapidly. Uh, yes, yes, uh, which I support, I think, um, People were tired of poverty, tired of starvation. So when people could start their own business, they want to keep more what they earned. And uh, look, the results, you know, it just took off. Yeah. It worked. Well, I got some questions. There's been a, I have a lot of questions, actually. And uh, I know a little bit about some of this stuff, but I would really like to get your perspective on it since you lived it. And... So one thing that I've always been interested in hearing about is the social credit scores that's going that are that are going on over there. Can you explain a little bit about what that is? So in my last uh, part one story, I talk about they tracked everybody mm -hmm. from birth to death. Right? My parents had to get permission to get married, and once you get married, you have to go to your local police station to register as a household formed. And when you add each child, you have to add a child into their household registration. And all the information is there. You get a little booklet. Okay, where you live, who you work for, and uh, and uh, how many people in your um, household. You get a 
benefits with that. You open up bank account, you go to hospital, you go to schools, you get your coupons with that. And when you become individual, like in student, you get a student file, track individual. When you become a worker, then you get a personnel file and continue tracking you. So social credit system supposed to be based on the traditional Chinese paper tracking, but now it's digital, digitalized. They got, I guess, idea from a Western's uh, FICA score, right? Yeah. They give you score to see your financial um, status and your behaviors if you're worse let for the people to lend you money so you can pay them back. They call the social credit because... Uh, they discovered, wow, this big tech is so convenient to track people. Everybody got a cell phone. If you just tie to their cell phone with everything they do, and, uh, you know, they, they were tracking people anyway by the papers, but now it's so easy. You cannot delete anything once you track them by cell phone too, right? So they started experiment in some uh, big cities. I think now... It's implemented all over the country. And uh, they basically, they used all different province and some uh, credit agencies um, by the provincial government and to develop a system um, to say that uh, everything is on your cell phone. So show social credit is not just about your financial behavior anymore. Like you, you own money, did you pay back on time? You own somebody stuff did you pay your mortgage on time now social credit means uh, how many facebook groups oh not facebook china don't use facebook banned um how many online like uh, groups you have what did you say uh, online and uh, did you say anything anti-government did your friends say anything anti-government in those groups on wechat so you are judged not just by your own speeches behaviors but you also are judged by the social networks you belong to. Let's say you belong to 50 WeChat groups, and uh, some of those group members say something not politically correct, needs to be censored. That can affect your score. And uh, also, they put everything on your phone to, like, a, let's say, they start, normally they start with when everybody gets 1,000. Points, right? Yeah. But, everybody, uh, hold on. Everybody starts with what? With 1,000 points. 1,000 points? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> That's a starting point. So if you behave same one, you share, you study Chairman Xi's red app, and you say something, you share something that's good, they want you to share, you get points. And you, 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 you don't own any debts, and you comply with everything, and... Uh, the ones you can get a bad point is, uh, okay, you owe lots of debt, you don't pay back. So your financial situation credit is bad. And you see something, they don't think it's uh, right. Is there on social media, on your, on your phone? Because everything is done on your phone now with apps and stuff and what yeah. you share. And uh, um, let's say if they catch you um, going to church, you're not supposed to go to church. And because the church is state sectioned, you have to go to Chinese state permitted churches. If you get caught, go to other places like home churches, which is banned, then you get to reduce points. And uh, once your points getting so low, like below 600 or something, then when you go to buy a train ticket, airplane ticket, they say, well, you credit the social credit score is so low, delight, you cannot travel, cannot borrow money to buy anything. Your kids can be affected by you, credit score, cannot go to the best school possible, cannot get a promotion, cannot get a mortgage, a business loans. So everything is, is a political size. It's just a lot more than fake score now. So I say that's so dangerous with COVID right now. Everybody has a, a QR code on the phone. So when they want to find out what is your status by testing you every day, right? Um, it's a code has to stay green color. 
So if you go to get tested, if they say, well, we test you and your code is red or orange, you lose your freedom. You cannot go out. Wow. So you still got to go swipe it. You got to go swipe and your phone app and QR code stay green. You can have your permitted freedom. That's why you see the big cities now all go nuts. Used to be bustling, busy cities. People have a small business, going to restaurants to eat and movie theaters and shopping. I just saw a video last night about Shenzhen, which is like a, the, um, one of the most open international special economic zone city in Shenzhen next to Hong Kong. It's like a ghost town. Very, really? very few people outside shopping, dining. Where are closed. they going? Are they all stuck inside? There's a long line testing. Everybody. COVID nineteen testing, and uh, my friend in Chengdu just said, "Oh, I was a uh, house quarantine for five days. I had to learn how to cook <laughs> because he used to rely on his wife to cook. It happened to be his wife was uh, traveling somewhere else, staying in the hotel, and he was quarantined, could not go out." For five days, because the one positive cases in his district, everybody's getting locked up. So he said, "Oh, I cook some simple meal." Show us picture. Said five days, five days. I was going crazy. He said, "At least I could teach some classes online. I, otherwise, I don't know what I'm gonna do because five days by yourself at home, and you couldn't go out. You had to cook something." But in Shanghai, my friends were locked down for ten weeks. They ran out of food to cook. They rely on government to deliver you food, and there was corruption, high prices, so they were hungry. They have money. They are retired lawyers. They were hungry, and、uh, so I'm just afraid. See, this kind of system already affected leaders in the free world. Did you see Maxim passport? Yeah, similar to China's social credit system. Tracking people, and you saw right now ESG score. Have you heard about that ESG score?、Um, environmental, social, governance score, which is adopted by、um, SP 500 Global Rating Agency to rate cities, state government, private corporations, public traded corporations. Your score based on Climate change, like let's say Utah State, the、yeah. state treasurer said,、uh, "My state is financially responsible, but we got a not so good ESG score because they judge you by climate change standards. How many companies you have in in terms of renewable energies? How many oil and gas companies you have in your state? It's a Political size, you have to comply with their narratives, with this kind of, a, I call it almost like a new agenda, global agenda. Make you comply, affect our supposed to be financial market, capital market. Like, a, did they learn? Did they learn something from China's social credit system? So long term, if you think about it, they can do this. To our state agent, states, cities, and the public traded companies, and they're gonna tell you small business owner, private company business, and they're gonna tell you individuals later. Everything、yeah. is subject to permission and license from the government on politics. Their political talking point. So everybody got to comply and toe the line. Otherwise, get canceled. Look what they're doing now: canceling media like comedian shows. You have to say the right words. You get censored words. That's exactly what happened, right? In in, in other mouth, words are censored. Scientists, artists, musicians all have to be careful to be PC. Dangerous stuff. Does that tie in with the camera systems as well? I, well, I, I, they, in one podcast, or or I think it was a podcast, I had heard you mention that there are there is one camera per every two citizens. In China, with facial recognition technology. Yes, they use this、uh, Western technology to make those lots of、uh, facial recognition cameras. 
So you can have millions of people walking in a city. Everywhere you go has a facial recognition cameras and also equipment to recognize your voice. When you go apply for a new cell phone in China, you scan your face and uh, you record your voice. So everything that on your cell phone later is tied to that. There's no privacy. You cannot go hiding. As a foreigners, when you go to China, when you, maybe when you go to custom, and now you know why Olympics athletes, when they went to China, they were recommended don't take your cell phone, take a, a like a cheap one-time disposable use phone. A burner phone. Burner phone or even laptop so that you don't have something and get it installed and then start to track, monitor everything going on on your phone. And it's a, it's a totally um, surveillance state. They, they don't think we deserve any kind of uh, privacy. And uh, I, I read this funny joke. One government official used his phone um, to pay for a prostitute and got immediately arrested. It's like, how stupid are you? You don't know how the opposite? They're also trying to get rid of cash. In China now, your banking record, your bank account, you, everything is connected with app on your phone. So when you use your phone to pay for stuff, it's all tracked. Well, they're doing that here now too. I mean, what was the, they just came out with, um, I can't remember the dollar amount, but I think it's if you have, is it if you spend more than, I can't remember the amount. Well, if you, you spend you more than, or if you have a certain amount yeah. in your bank account, then the government tracks. Well, Do you remember, remember the number? Remember, used to be five thousand. Used to be ten thousand dollars. It's five hundred dollars. Now it's like a, it become like five thousand. I even don't know what is the current number now. Um, that's why the big banking subject to government regulations in the name of remember it used to be in the name of anti and. Um, Terrorism war, right? Mm -hmm. Then they're gonna track everything. You think every cash you withdraw on um, cash could be potentially drug money you take or you deposit. And uh, I was told by my bank a few years in Colorado, anything over five thousand dollars at the end of the day, they send all that record from the bank to this government source. Yeah. Uh, site. And uh, that's why you know why people like a. Uh, Cryptocurrency, right? It's well, China blockchain. banned that too, correct? Well, they banned. They don't want competition. Yeah. They want their own cryptocurrency. You know, China trying to promote one, and it did not take off. And they banned Bitcoin. They banned lots of cryptos, but still, they just created black market. People still use that because lots of Chinese wealthy Chinese today, their money is stuck in China. So how do they get them out, it, you know? And, and um, so sometimes they have to figure out creative way or private way. So they look at the blockchain technology and they also look at the offshore um, business uh, accounts. Like that's why, you know, Hong Kong, they just took over Hong Kong. And uh, because actually lots of businesses use Hong Kong that time to do business and to also watch money and, uh, but now, they, they all have to, you know, really um, keep their head down. When you talk about public uh, facial recognition camera law, I remember the goal is to have 600 million public facial recognition cameras throughout the whole China. 600 million? Yeah. We have 1.4 billion Chinese. China has 1.4 billion Chinese. United States, think about, we have like a 300, what, 300... 30 million people. Yeah. Is that scary number to even think about it? And the voice recording. I, I, I don't know how people feel. And if you go to Hong Kong now, because Hong Kong lost to China control, as a foreigner, you go to Hong Kong. And because they impose national security law to Hong Kong. So if you have American passport, but you go there, say something, it's a threat to CCP. 
in the name of national security law, they can arrest you, lock you up. Yeah. Just, well, I guess I won't be visiting China anytime soon. Oh, you have to be careful <laughs> what you say. <laughs> I've already said enough. <laughs> Do you think this? Do you think they're trying to do that to, with the entire world, and that's what the TikTok thing is? I mean, the TikTok, TikTok's basically, it's essentially an enormous Chinese spy operation. People have to understand how China's system works. China is one-party dictatorship, the largest totalitarian regime in the whole world, and uh, if a company gets that big, right? And uh, Chinese uh, entrepreneurs uh, are pretty smart. They created lots of good products. But there's one thing they cannot escape. China's national security law. One-party dictatorship. Any company in China is subject to the one-party rule. TikTok on your kids' apps and have all the data. If the Chinese government, CCP, said, I need all your users' data. They have to turn over. They, they, are, they, they are not like us, like, oh, I want to protect the privacy. I, I cannot turn that over to you. My government always trying to get data on private citizens, and, and you know. Um, but in China, you have no choice. Or you lose your business, you get shut down. You know, billionaires disappear or, you know, forced to leave their positions, retire earlier, and force them to give to charities all the time, you know? And, uh, and you also saw how dangerous this is. You saw what happened to trucker freedom in Canada. Mm -hmm. Trudeau, they learn a lot from Chinese Communist Party. So they shut down people's bank accounts. If you're a trucker, you don't want to comply to vaccine mandate, vaccine passport, you cannot withdraw money. And look what's going on in China today. That because the real estate bubbles start to burst, people who were paying for mortgages have not got their house built yet, their apartment built. And, uh, and after the lockdown, they went to bank to, de to, to get the money out. Bank run. No, you cannot with your money. So people start protesting, and uh, and they get beat up. In Hulan province, there are some other cities. Now it's got more and more cities. People come out to say, we stop paying for mortgages. We have not got our apartment supposed to be built. And some company already went bankrupt and were never built. We stop paying for mortgages. And so because people cannot get the money from their bank, I mean, how do they, I mean, they need the money to, to, to live. So they all just, also just stop paying for mortgages. So, hey, I cannot even afford food and rent. Why should I pay for mortgage? You will never deliver. I think the China economy, economy right now is, uh, it could have a financial, or is already having the financial crisis. But you don't hear that. They want to censor that information. Remember, they control all the media. And they, they don't talk about it. Yeah. And... Uh, China's uh, debt is very high, um, like 250% of their GDP. Their economy is big, supposed to be, if their number is even trustworthy, $18 trillion GDP. Then 250% of GDP is their debt. So, but also the private citizens' money deposit, it's lots of their, you know, cash in, and, and, um, and the bank's assets, but now people stop paying for mortgages. How is this going to collapse China economy and CCP and affect the world financial market and the economy? Because uh, unfortunately, so many people today still rely on China for the supply chains. And uh, <laughs> I think the whole world does. Yeah, the whole world does. It's like uh, when you want to section Putin, but you rely on Putin for oil for lots of supplies and, and, and for even food and fertilizer from Ukraine, of course, you're going to suffer consequences. So, so I have been calling out that uh, free world countries have been infiltrated by CCP. Yeah. They have spent lots of money. 
through their united front, which Chinese call Tong Zhan Bu, united front overseas branch to get money into Confucius Institute, into our schools and colleges for past 18 years. It, you know, I think uh, last year, um, the last one just finished in New Hampshire. And, but now the Confucius Institute funded by government, by CCP, is uh, changing name to a very good name called the Chinese International Education Foundation. Really? Yes. And so that way they can use that to fund money into our colleges and still continue to um, push for their agenda. In, in, you know, indoctrinate our students, not just Chinese students coming here to study, have a university exchange programs. And, uh, you know, even Harvard, you know, like the, I mean, lots of private university got lots of money from China uh, in the past and failed to report to our, you know, the, the, the uh, federal government department of education is supposed to disclose that. So, well, so, they're setting up these companies all over the world that it's, you know. They bought a lot of companies during COVID, too. They're so, setting up companies all over the world. They pay the company, and then the company donates the money to the school or the business or, or, yes, or whatever. And, so it's uh, not. We need to follow the money. You are yeah. right. Follow <clears throat> the money. It's dark money. Called the dark money funneled into our schools, nonprofit organizations, government, even interfere with our elections. Um, I don't know if people noticed that uh, last year when Chinese professor was speaking Mandarin, he was bragging about interference into U.S. elections. He said, uh, we, we, that means the Chinese government, we could not fix Trump. But now we have the friends in the highest U.S. government. And that video got took down immediately. But lots of people, like, uh, shot it, yeah. record it, and keep the record. So that show you where they stand. They can buy companies. In ca they can invest in your own local economy, create jobs, buy land. They're trying to buy land and building this infrastructure for agricultural business in North Dakota right now near Grand Fork, our military base. And I was on their North Dakota TV to say, no. Don't do it. You need to absolutely oppose this. And the Senator Cotton has a bill to, to ban Chinese firms tied to CCP from buying land in America. I agree. I support that. You know why? As a foreigners, even as a Chinese citizen in China, you are forbidden to buy land. Per constitution of China, Land belongs to the state. They call it belongs to the people. That people is the state, whoever yeah. has power. So you foreign companies and foreigners and Chinese citizens all cannot buy land. Why are we so naive? Let them come here. Oh, Chinese firms come here to buy business, buy company, and set, set up the buildings. And one just shut down by FBI quietly in our capital. They could use Huawei. They very advanced surveillance equipment to actually um, spy on our capital and our politicians and military's uh, communication network. I, we have been very, very naive. And also people thought, hey, China economy is good now. Maybe we just keep doing business with them. And they will become like us, a democratic country. The opposite has happened. Yeah. Yeah, very dangerous. Let's talk about some of the concentration camps over there. And I've heard you mention organ harvesting as well. How common is organ harvesting? Well, I left China in 1988. In the 90s, my dad even told me there's this massive meditation practice called the Qigong, later called the Falun Gong, Falun Gong. Basically, it's a kind of a branch of, um, you know, Buddhist um, movement to meditate. So it's a health practice. Um, you sit down, you meditate, um, you know, kind of similar to yoga, but it, it's more traditional Chinese style. And for a long time, you meditate. It's very good for um, 
health reasons. Some people cannot cure their health issues except doing this. So at the beginning, the government promoted because lots of people, Communist Party members, also benefit from this uh, practice and got cured. And uh, but they had like one time one hundred million members, and Chinese Communist Party only had like ninety million members. So they were huge. So one time their member was falsely arrested. So the Falun Gong practitioners went to Beijing near the compound of all the officials and just sit down there, meditate, and kind of like a peaceful protest. Jiang Zemin was the president that time, and he saw that as absolutely threat to the power, dominant power of CCP. So he banned it. Once he banned it in the nineteenth, nineteen ninety nine. So this, that means anybody who practices that gets arrested, and uh, estimated one million people got arrested and disappeared into the dark prisons, and uh, without due process. How many people? A million. A million. Yes, without due For process. For meditating. For meditating, for practice, this、uh, Falun Gong, and they're very healthy people because, you know, this is good for your health to practice this. Um, I heard that、uh, I was already in this country. I had to learn about that, and I heard all of a sudden China, um, was accused to use their organs were still their life, because Chinese culture do not encourage people to donate the organs. They want to die as a whole body, and there's no cultural tradition of, oh, I'm gonna donate my organs to save another life. But now you can go to China, you know. There's a phone conversations and records and testimony to show. You can get a a liver. You can get a, a kidney, for about one hundred seventy, one hundred eighty thousand dollars per each, and the waiting. For three weeks. Three weeks. Say fresh, very <clears throat> fresh, and、uh, whistleblowers start to tell people once once they come out to say, I was forced to take organs, I couldn't do it, I I I you know escaped and and the United Nations were urged to investigate. China deny it, and the、uh, some Western countries like I think a.、Uh, European countries like Great Britain, maybe Canada, all condemned it and forbidden their、um, organ tourists go to China to schedule for organ、uh, transplant surgery because they say that's crime against humanity. I was just in D.C. in middle of July. I marched with the Falun Gong practitioners, two thousand of them at the, at the Capitol. Every year, and、um, they、uh, June, I think it's July twentieth. Uh, it's the their anniversary to be banned, and they will protest here. And they were so decent people. They will meditate. They will march, and they will hold the signs to you know to against this、uh, crime against humanity. Stop organ harvesting.、Um, I think we need to really come out strongly support those people. Their their base is in New York, but they go to D.C. and in New York they protest and every year. Whose organs are they harvesting? The Falun Gong practitioners, and、uh, they're healthy.、Um, I saw some pictures that、uh, they were give you injection, like if you were in the prison, they give you injection, where you were kind of、uh, passed out, and they take your organs and take your cornea from your eyes. Yeah. So they're taking it from prisoners. Yes, and they die. Then they die, and、uh, here's another thing. And I, just for the record. It's prison in China doesn't necessarily mean you're some type of a felon. No, those are felon. There's a you could have a maybe a low social credit score. But they're Falun Gong practitioners. That means they're prisoners of conscience because of their religious belief and they practice meditation. So there's no trial, no due process. You don't know who is the prison. So they go there, keep them, and they test them. They keep track of their health, and when they have a,、uh, when they need your organs and you have a match, then you get to choose and pick, 
and uh, basically murder you for organs. Some people say the Xinjiang, like a Uyghur's cultural genocide is going on. Maybe they are also, if they run out of uh, Falun Gong practitioners, they might have to look at the uh, cultural genocide, Xinjiang Uyghur people who got arrested in the prisons. Maybe they could be also the target. Uh, the thing is, so China is one of the five Security Council of United Nations and the Council of Human Rights uh, Council. No investigations. None. And I think that the Western free world countries really need to come out strongly to condemn this. And also tie that human rights violations, abuses with our trade deals with China. I, I'm just worried. I want to warn our business people. Think about what is long-term consequences of you. Just focus on profit, money-making inside the China market. Remember, Lenin said, let's deal with capitalists. Let, let them make a rope sell to us. We'll buy rope from them. But we will use the same ropes to hand them later. Yeah. So we need to, I mean, why should we continue to do business with a country like that? I'm calling for decoupling from a PRC market. If you are still doing business, buying from them, it's time to uh, evaluate your options. Of course, as a, our country need to bring our manufactured homes back here, cut regulations, cut taxes, to give incentive for business people to manufacture their products here, to provide services here. Mm -hmm. But if you cannot compete, you have so much government red tapes and control and the high regulations, uh, climate change. That's why gas prices are so high. You know, we have to buy from other countries. Inflation is high. Uh, and there are so many things that it's caused unnecessarily by our bad Democrat-controlled government policies. That so we rely on China, we rely on Middle East for oil, and and uh, rely on Russia. I mean, Europeans heavily rely on Russia, and doing business with those not friendly countries, we're hurting ourselves. We're hurting our national security because you cannot even negotiate from the position of strength. We're so weak as a country right now. In the eyes, China's laughing at us. Yeah. That's why they can threaten us and they can threaten Nancy Pelosi to go to Taiwan. Let an unelected totalitarian regime to threaten democratically elected our representatives. Is, a, is this a wake up call? We should have wake up earlier, long time ago. Instead of right now, Biden is awake. So he's already talking about, you know, let go of lots of tariffs. And because, you know, we need China for lots of products and stuff. It's time to decouple from China's economy. If they're going to threaten us like this, eventually they're going to use a force to take Taiwan. They will not even care what we stand as a U.S. government, as a people of the U.S. So we have to really take this very seriously. China is our biggest national security threat right now, not Russia. What do you think, why do you think, <clears throat> excuse me, why do you think China is 100% behind Russia right now? Because the they Ukraine share the similar ideologies. Remember, former Soviet Union was a communist, Bolshevik country, and uh, China has been always controlled by one-party dictatorship. They have a more common ground than China with Western countries, with the U.S. Mm -hmm. Democracy, freedom, personal liberties, they hate that. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you're going to let your citizens, individual citizens have right to vote and the right to criticize government and the right to do like a, their business without our control, without the, you know complying with the, our laws. You are a threat to us. It's all about their power, their control. That's what communists do. They don't value individual rights, freedom, liberty, and private property. 
So all the capitalists want to sell China something, you know, now it's time to question long term what's going to happen if you continue to do this without holding China accountable for their human rights abuses. No, they can't just threaten the United States whenever they want to. They were threatened to shut down Pelosi's airplane. What are they going to do next? What if they really take Taiwan? Are we ready to have the free world totally shut down China's economy because they're going to use a force, attack Taiwan, a truly democratic you know, country? They might say, oh, Taiwan is part of us. Well, that's what they say. Well, that's why U.S. has been very, very ambiguous about, oh, we, 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 we have one China policy, and, you know, but we also will back Taiwan. So that's like a, since 1979, Carter administration threw Taiwan under the bus, made a deal with communist China. That's where we are today. But our elected officials can go to Taiwan, can talk to them, can call, can do business, and they can, if they want to, whatever they call it, maintain status quo, but we need to morally stand up for Taiwan. We need the military sending whatever equipment they need. And they need to hurry up. I heard there's some deals got delayed by Biden administration. And uh, Taiwan is under risk right now. So we need to do lessons right. If you don't decouple with China, then how do you do economic sections against China if they invade Taiwan? Why are we still allowing Chinese big firms come to Wall Street and uh, you know you take advantage of our free market and capital investment? Lots of dollars, lots of dollars, include some uh, pension funds in the United States invest in China, maybe managed by BlackRock, it's very big in China. And uh, so we need to look at uh, all aspects right now, reevaluate what we have been doing in the past, like a, 20 something years since China joined WTO, the World Trade Organization. What is <clears throat> what do you think China's end game is? What is their what is their goal? Is it world domination? Yes. Is that what it is? It's called a Xi Jinping's Chinese dream. He called that Chinese dream. It's not Chinese people's dream. Chinese people are the biggest victims of their own regime and government. They're not treated as human beings. So Chinese dream is a CCP, Xi Jinping dream. By 2049, it's on their agenda. PRC will become the dominant power economically, largest economy in the world. They're second largest right now after US. Militarily and the Politically. That's why they use the Silk Road Initiative, one, like a one, one bell, one road, billions of dollars international debt trap investing in developing countries. I went to South Africa 2018. As soon as I get off the um, major airport, a big sign, back of China leads African people to prosperity. And they gave money uh, as a loan to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka filed a bankruptcy, right? It's comp you know, they took over um, the Sri Lanka's airport. Once they stopped paying the debt, they could not make the payment. And China took over Djibouti, an uh, African country, as a military base there because they also use a Silk and Road initiative. Um, people start wake up to say maybe this is debt trap, you know, very very good interest, um, low interest loan to big infrastructure projects. But as soon as you cannot pay, uh, they take over. You lose power to negotiate, and uh, guess lots of those governments anyway. Corruptions everywhere. For, I mean, like uh, who knows what know, they do their, with their money, right? For the goal. To be global domination, they're doing a pretty damn good job, and they're doing everything that they should be doing. Right. And they're going to take it without firing a shot. And they're doing BRICS now. So BRICS, like a like a, the Western countries have a, like a G7, right? And they want to their own in you know, like a alliance. 
So it used to be the you know the you know breaks and that means you know like I think uh, um you know India, China, Russia, and uh, um some countries in it. Um, now they're gonna expand it. They just talk to North Korea, and Iran, and all those uh, not friendly countries with U.S. Yeah. to invite them to join China's BRICS alliance. So we have to be very smart about what we're doing before it's too late. And uh, the uh, they communists, people might be naive to think after falling of Berlin Wall that, uh, oh, you know, communists uh, took a pause, took a break. No. China's communists learned from that. They do not want what happened to the collapse of the Soviet Union happen to them. So they are very, very um, savvy in terms of how we are going to maintain power, influence, control in the world. Their people are hungry, starving, but they spend lots of money overseas and uh, to form alliances, to buy foreign companies, foreign government, corporations, even YouTuber influencers. They created those YouTubers who can make China look wonderful. There are some all over the world. You can tell they, they probably got money from China and they, they talk to their narratives. And I watch both because uh, even in also Mandarin Chinese, so I get to know what they're talking about. What is their argument? And guess what? They bought AMC, our movie theater chain owned by Chinese firm. All the newspapers in this country, Chinese Mandarin newspapers, they were the big shareholders, Chinese were. Look how many of them interview me, except the uh, NTD TV and uh, the Epoch Times. Those are the media um, empire started by Falun Gong practitioners, they're anti-CCP. All the rest, they don't interview me. I am the only Republican candidate in the whole country right now for Congress born and raised in Communist China. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> earlier today off camera, you mentioned that the CCP has been in contact with you, has threatened you. What? How are they contacting you? What are they threatening you with? Well, I wanted to, I wanted to actually go back to China visit my family and friends. Two thousand nineteen. I think they discovered me right before my trip from social media on Facebook. I post something people like share a lot. I talk about how, you know, I came to this country with nothing. Now I'm living American dream and uh, I fled the tyranny and the poverty. Come here. I was educator. I'm still on the speaker bureau for VOC. Victims of a Communism Memorial Foundation based in D.C. to educate our kids in middle school, high school, and colleges. And I also go to long parties and organizations, grassroots, and, uh, and uh, you know, to speak about my personal experience, horrors of communism and socialism, because I discovered they need an eyewitness to, like me to go. And uh, they discovered me because of my speaking for past five years as a, you know, educator, speaker, I have lots of followers. So when I post something, it is shared like a lot. And they discover me. And then they start to come on to attack me, troll me, and threaten me. And uh, 2015, I had my AR-15 picture in front of US flag. That picture was seen by 1.3 million people on social media, online. I, I want people that, uh, you know, the largest killer, the champion of mass killer is always a tyrannical government. Look what happened in Tiananmen Square. And uh, I got threatened. They even threatened my children. And uh, I, I think uh, the threat come, I think at that time, was overseas or something. So I totally ignore that. What, but, how did they threaten you? What did they say? Oh, most of them just say, oh, you look so scary by holding down that AR-15. And one guy later, my husband found out he was based in UK. 
and he said, "Watch out, lady! Like I'm going to、um, use that to like、uh, what do you call the crush your daughter's head or something? My children, my my daughter." And、um, so, how do you know that's CCP? I don't know. I don't know that. But、uh, so we let that go because that was 2015 one gun picture, right? My AR-15 picture talk about. But the CCP spies are everywhere in the world, not just in the U.S. In free world, all over. And、uh, my husband did a call. We did a call FBI, and then said, "Oh, don't worry. It's a, it's like a trace to somebody in UK." We also reported to Facebook. Then 2019. They were long stop, like twelve of them. Some dressed, some is white, some is Chinese, some is Indian looking, and they they threatened me in both Chinese and English, bad English, and they copy paste, copy paste, call me all kind of bad names, call me CIA agent, traitor, you know, like a yellow dog, and uh, and uh, don't you ever want to come back to China or to Asia? It's like they own the Asia now. I cannot even go to maybe. Thailand or something. Whenever they have a treaty, then they can use a national security law, and you know, like、uh, whoever they want, you know, this foreign country has to, you know, send the, the people they want back to China. So I had to cancel my trip. Then most recently, this this February, I was already running as a congressional candidate. I did. I announced in January. I put on social media. I oh, I'm gonna speak. In Cache County of Utah, as a keynote speaker for Republican committee, two hundred, like two hundred fifty people, Republicans came to listen to my talk, and then one Chinese spy showed up. Out of two hundred fifty people, nobody knew who he was. A Chinese man in his thirties come to tape my whole thing, paid seventy five dollars for the dinner and event, and then told people at table, "You all been brainwashed by her. Our leaders are." Fathers, they're not like the United States elected by the people. They left, never say hi to me, and the people thought that was strange, odd. So they told me about it, and Feng Jiang, that's the name, and they have his email address. And、uh, on the way drive to the speaking site in Salt Lake City, I saw one school had a sign there, Confucius Institute. That means their people are there nearby. So they saw me, troll me on my social media. Oh, I'm gonna speak there. Here's a where you can register, pay money, and come. And he come. So that's why now, from now on, I don't put my location on social media. And when I went to California, speak to the、um, at the memorial for June Fourth Tiananmen Square massacre, they hired a security guard for the event. And because、uh, you know, as somebody from New Hampshire, we have constitution to carry in New Hampshire, <laughs> but I, I cannot do anything when I go to other, you know, and、yeah. state, big blue states and cities, you know. And so I'm telling people because my unique voice and my stories, I can make an impact in this country, and I cannot be corrupted. I will tell the truth. That's why I got lots of attacks, and not just CCP. Maybe they were found no. Money attacks through my opponents in this race, and、uh, but I said, well, I survived a mouse cultural revolution. I will survive everything. Liberty is my north star. I will do whatever I can to tell my stories. I cannot be silenced. I cannot live in fear. <clears throat> you know, Lily, we covered a lot of ground, and I want to start to wrap this up. But one of my biggest fears. Is that China has over three thousand years of archived records, wisdom to pull from. We have less than two hundred fifty years of wisdom to pull from, and I, you know, if you look at it that way, the odds aren't the odds aren't great when you have three thousand years of knowledge to draw from as compared to what we have. Two hundred fifty. What's it going to take for us to pull away from this and to get out, and 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 to get out from under the China influence? I am a、uh, kind of terrified for our country, and I have been educated for five years. Say how the Marxist、um, indoctrination happening in our schools. 
and uh, I'm a very starch supporter of uh, school choice, educational freedom account, and the parental rights and parental control. I've been telling people that what is going on today in America? I call that neo-Marxist cultural revolution I saw in China. There are lots of, I categorized 12 tactics and similarities between the one I survived and the, the current one is happening in the USA. But of course, it's not more scale, it's in selective places, but in, in terms of massive student indoctrination that are happening regardless you live in red state, blue state, public schools. Why? Should the people wake up to ask why their parents lost control of what their kids are taught in schools? Why our teachers today are almost like a trained social justice warriors? want to force down your kids through about critical race theory, about 1619 project, about social emotional learning, about transgender ideology into our kids. And if we as parents feel passionate against that and speak up at the school board meetings, then you got the federal government could target you as a potential domestic Terrorist? Are you kidding me? Parents who love their kids, who don't want this kind of crap to indoctrinate their kids. I feel terrified because I see this similarity. For example, five red classes, five black classes under oppressor oppressed happening here. There's a whole bunch of categories by some federal agencies now, if you dig into it, by whistleblowers, whistleblowers, what kind of groups are oppressors? What kind of groups are under oppressed? It's a scary, this sim similar. You're white male, you're born racist. So you're born by association, you're born guilty by something you cannot control and you're guilty by something you said you did many years ago, they're gonna cancel you. Like lots of people lose jobs and careers business because what they said done in the past. I even don't know what else can come back to bite you like they can dig into 20 years ago. But they're so righteous. And I can be, I was called uh, having extremism in New Hampshire after my first debate. And uh, the New Hampshire Democrats tweeted, the granny staters in New Hampshire will reject my extremism. <laughs> what is my extremism? I love America. I live in American dream. I don't want indoctrination in our schools. I do not think America is a systemic racist country. I believe in civil rights movement have come a long way. I love people to be united and to be, you know, like uh, all created equal. I'm a people of color, minority, business, woman, and just love this country. I want to tell my stories, but I'm an extremist. So if you don't believe the government and create a massive dependency on government, I use taxpayers' money to fund all those big government projects, include all the government schooling without parental, you know, and consent and control, I'm an extremist. And I have say conservatives got shut down, churches closed, and uh, people are afraid to speak up. I have Democrats who write it to me anonymously to say, Lily, thank you for what you're doing. And uh, we will vote, but we're afraid to speak up right now. We will lose our job, we will lose our careers. How many good teachers trapped inside of our schools, but are afraid they work activists. Look at our military people are being fired because they could not get a religious exemption, vaccine mandates. And they're trying to offer, army trying to offer $50,000 sign up bonus for six years service, but you have to get vaccinated. 
use taxpayers' money to offer people. Lots of young people I met, they don't want to join because they mandate, because they politicize the army. So we, we are hurting our recruitment goal. We are hurting our readiness. China is laughing to the bank. Yes, our military is all focused on social issues, but not the readiness. And our federal agencies, are they still on people's side? Are they still swear to defend our constitution rights? And our politicians who are so divisive? And our people, lots of them don't know what's happening in China, what's happening in this country, what are happening in history, what's happening in Venezuela. I just met a Uber driver last night, dropped me off at my hotel, said, Lily, I'm from Venezuela. My family are hungry, stuck there. I've been here. I'm illegal here for four years now. And I love America. I'm like you. I'm worried about America. Why are they all using similar tactics and terms here? Equity, for example, is a communist term. Equal outcome. But the corporation trainings, called the less whiteness trainings, DEI, DEI, diversity, equity, and including trainings, all talk about equity. But uh, they only talk about equity of skin color, of race and skin. But they don't want diversity of ideas, personalities, skills, talents. Most important diversity in my mind is actually diverse ideas, thoughts, voices, and uh, problem-solving solutions. No, they don't talk about that. You have to tell the left line. I'm just worried about this country is becoming more and more like the country left. But I have a faith in American people. I have a faith in our constitutional republic that if people wake up, if people get to the truth, and there will be a, a massive walking away from that kind of far right, far left, far radical ideologies. And um, we don't want to go down the socialist path, but there are 100 members of progressive caucus people in the US Congress right now. And I will be our lumber when I get into Congress, <laughs> like uh, AOC, right? I mean, it's more than just quad, there are like 100 of them. And uh, they all want socialist policies. And my Democrat opponent, um, Congresswoman Custer, has been there for 10 years. She votes for those policies. She votes with them. Yeah. And, uh, and talk about equity all the time. You cannot have an equal outcome without doing socialism and communism, which is use government force to redistribute wealth, period. So we should not even use that term. But everybody is probably use that term from the left side. It, it, it really scares me and other immigrants to say, what's going on in America? It's really... I, I always tell them, please, if you have good immigrant story, share that with me on my YouTube channel. We need more and more immigrants. Stand up, speak up to save our country now from this taking over destruction of, you know, far left socialist policies, ideologies. Otherwise, we, we have no place to go. This is our new country. Yeah. Well, how do people find you? And they can go to my website at lilytongwilliams.com. I'm uh, um, having lots of interviews like this, my published articles, endorsements on there. And if uh, all the grassroots people could donate 20 bucks and 10 bucks each, I would really appreciate it. I'm a grassroots candidate. I'm not establishment candidate. So I'm all raised in my primary. And the primary is September 13th. And I call my grass, my campaign is truly a grassroots movement, almost like a populist movement for life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And uh, because uh, we are human beings as an individual person. And I am on social media, Facebook page, Lily for Congress. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I have a YouTube channel, English and Mandarin Chinese. I'm a, I'm a very, very staunch supporter of all our constitutional rights. And especially on Second Amendment, I'm the long compromise candidate. Without our Second Amendment rights, we cannot defend 
our other rights at all. And um, so I hope people will support me and donate to my campaign. If you're in New Hampshire, please also volunteer and share my messages, share my um, interviews. And uh, we're going to win this. It's not about me. This is about our liberty, our American dream at the stake. Well, I just want to wish you the best of luck and thank you for coming on. I well, really thank appreciate. you for having me. You know, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. We'll be watching. Yes, please. I, God is good since I come to this country. So I, I believe God. I believe that ultimately goodness will prevail. Liberty will prevail. And the world population who love freedom and love democracy will prevail in this world. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, best of luck. I appreciate it. Cheers. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.